Okay, we are recording now and we are going to start the 2020 Terrasan Colloquium. Uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, talks ahead, so I'm not going to waste much time on introductions. And in fact, the first speaker uh, doesn't need any introduction at all. I'd like to give uh, the floor uh, to Howard Bloom. Howard, the floor is yours. Uh Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank Julio for putting this conference together. I want to thank him for giving me the opportunity to keynote the conference. And the conference is about transpartisan approaches to the intersection of space expansion, emerging technologies, and human rights. I wanted to start with the ethics of space expansion, emerging technologies, and human rights, because ethics and technology is a subject that really bothers me. It's not that I'm afraid of technology, I'm not. I'm afraid of ethicists. Our most important ethical imperative is never to choke technology. Our most important ethical imperative is never to strangle promising new technologies with the noose of so-called ethical thinking. Look, a hammer can be used to build a house or a hammer can be used to kill. But because a hammer can be used to kill, we don't ban the use of hammers. We need to smother our impulse to freeze innovation with ethical considerations. Our most important ethical imperative is to do with technology what we do with our citizens. We give them freedom and only come after them if they are planning or perpetrating actual criminal behavior. If we use the kinds of ethical arguments that I hear these days with regards to technology, we would point out how frequently humans have been killers and would straitjacket every male when he turns 12 years old. Look, new technologies will take us to the skies. New technologies will give us human rights of kinds we never imagined before, entirely new human capabilities. So never put a straitjacket on, on imagination and invention. It's innovation that will save the planet. And I'll go into that in a few seconds. It's innovation that will save the human race. It's innovation that will save nature by giving nature what nature aches for the most, new homes, new niches in which to flourish. It's innovation that will give nature new homes in the sky. It's innovation that will garden the solar system and green the galaxy. Garden the solar system and green the galaxy just happens to be the name of a uh, hundred picture uh, video manifesto that, or visual manifesto that I wrote for the National Space Society a few years ago. And it's been adopted as the National Space Society's official vision. And basically what Garden the Solar System Green the Galaxy points out is that once upon a time, there was an incredibly ghastly planet, a poison pill of stone the home of climate catastrophe, circling a mediocre yellow star. And that climate, that ball of stone was so inimical to anything we might think of as life. It was such an impossible place in which life could exist um, that it changed its temperature um, every three hours. Every three hours, the temperature went up 88 degrees, Every three hours, it went down 88 degrees. For three hours, it was bathed in this poisonous stuff called um, radiation. And for another three hours, it was buried in this equally poisonous stuff called darkness. Plus, it had a tilt to its axis. So as it went around this middling yellow sun, it went through massive climate catastrophes, a massive climate change. We call those catastrophes summer, winter, fall, and spring. That planet was the Earth. Even its atmosphere and its seas were seething vats and seething bell jars of poisonous gases and liquids. And yet, somehow, and we really do not know how, a very strange experiment in a highly complex system of um, mega molecularity came along and worked out all kinds of tricks 
in the middle of these disasters and catastrophes that allowed it to make duplicate copies of itself. And despite all of the enormous and dangerous change going on around it, lethal change, it managed to survive and it operated under a couple of different imperatives. One was kidnap, seduce, and recruit as many dead atoms and molecules as you could find and bring them in to the process of life. And the other was be imperialistic, be colonialistic, take as much territory as you can possibly find, take as many of these disasters that you find yourself in the middle of and turn them into opportunities. And that's what life has been doing ever since. There's a, an instructive example from about 120 million years ago. Um, these creatures that come along that we call dinosaurs, um, flourishing in the midst of this um, planet of climate disaster. And um, the creatures had managed to find a way to, uh, well, let's go back a little step. First of all, life started in the sea. Going to land was an impossible um, space program. And if you've been the parent to one of the uh, unicellular creatures that wanted to go up on land, you would have uh, counseled your offspring, do not go there. It's absolutely impossible. The pace is ble bleached by radiation. It's banged by darkness. Um, it has no water for you, no place for you to exist. And yet, some of these single-celled creatures managed to take to the land. Many, many years later, um, uh, roughly um, uh, at least 640 million years later, there were dinosaurs. And some dinosaurs had the biological equivalent of a crazy idea. They wanted to enter another dark, empty, and impossible place where there was absolutely nothing for them. Um, they wanted to fly. Now, if you've been one of their parents, one of the nice conservative, um, eco-friendly dinosaurs, you would have said, don't you dare. Haven't you looked into the sky? There's nothing up there for you. There is nothing to eat. There is no place for you to nest. There is no protection. There's nothing up there. Look above your head one more time. Look at what's up there, nothing. And yet those loony dinosaurs made the, again, genetic decision to fly. Now, today, um, many of you haven't gone out yet because it's early in the morning in some places. Some of you are in places where you have gone out. But when you go out today, how many of the conservative dinosaurs who did things in an eco-friendly way are you likely to see? And the answer is zero, none, not a single one. And how many of the loony dinosaurs who took to the skies are you likely to see? You're going to see at the very least dozens and possibly hundreds because they're called birds. What's more, there are twice as many birds as there are land walking species like mammals, which means there are twice as many ways to make a living in the vast and hostile emptiness of the sky as there are to make a living down here on the surface of the land. And there's one more little fact that's worth considering. If you are born a sky creature, let's say anything from a bird to a bat, you will have a 60% longer lifespan than the lifespan of creatures that walk the earth. Now, is nature trying to tell us anything? Like go up young man or young woman? go up, um, that natural's, uh, nature's natural inclination is to look at the laws of nature and to break them and to celebrate breaking them because every time nature breaks a law, nature makes entirely new laws. And frankly, nature is uh, willful and nature is ambitious. Nature does this kind of stuff all the time. Well, when it comes to innovation, um, if the parental generation, the generation of conservatives,
the generation of eco-thinkers, had been allowed their way, none of their children would have taken to the sky. Um, innovation led to whole new kinds of animal rights. Um, innovation leads to whole new kinds of human rights. Um, we are about, well, as of yesterday, um, yesterday, um, no, it was the day before yesterday, Tuesday, um, SpaceX tried something really cheeky. Instead of just working with the kinds of conventional rockets that everybody else uses that can at most lift uh, four people, uh, four humans to the sky at a time, SpaceX put, started to uh, launch a prototype of a vehicle that's designed to take 100 humans to the skies at once. 100 humans to Mars, 100 humans, 100 humans to the moon. Um, the, the launch, it's a, only a prototype, um, but the launch was almost perfect. Um, the takeoff was perfect. Um, the rise to eight miles high was perfect. A belly flop maneuver that's necessary to allow this rocket to land on its tail, uh, to come down without burning itself up in the atmosphere, then land on its tail was absolutely perfect. The only problem came when the rocket tried to settle down on the ground and the ground and the rocket had a slight disagreement about where the empty air ended and the solid stuff began and the rocket blew up. When we do things like this, we open whole new kinds of human possibilities we never imagined before. That rocket, the uh, SpaceX Starship, will open whole new possibilities that even Elon Musk, its maker, has never, ever dreamed of. And those are the things we come to regard as human rights. So that's one lesson in never stopping uh, a technology before its time. Another is um, right now, um, actually it's Elon who's doing the same thing in a different area. Um, it's called his Neuralink project. About in 1970, I started writing about something I called the ultimate chip. And the ultimate chip was something that could be an implant or it could connect with your brain without any physical implantation. And it was there so that when you wake up in the morning and you have that brilliant idea on your way to the bathroom, and it's so brilliant that you know that you will forget, forget it, that you will remember it after you are finished fumbling for the toilet paper. Uh, and by the time you get back to uh, a space where you've got paper and pencil, it's gone. And it's gone forever. The ultimate chip will store that idea for you. The ultimate chip, when you are on a business trip to Rome, and you've just landed, you're traveling on your own to save your company money, of course, if travel ever comes back again, um, and you go down to the hotel lounge um, looking for human company, but you're intimidated. You're surrounded by people you don't know. You don't even know how to speak their language. Um, the ultimate chip will tell you who's who in the bar using facial recognition. The new chip will point you to people with whom you share interests. The ultimate chip will give you uh, opening conversational lines with which to start conversation. And the ultimate chip will translate back and forth between Italian and English. So that you and a person who doesn't speak a word of English um, can communicate. Um, these are the kinds of new capabilities that are just around the corner for us. And as I say, 100, uh, even 50 years from now, we will regard the things that these devices allow us to do as absolute rights. But until we develop these things, uh, these rights will simply not come into existence. And what I, I have friends who are ethicists and the mere sound of their voice sometimes makes me cringe. I love them, they are delightful people. It isn't the sound of their voices by itself that's making me cringe. It's their way of poking into um, technological business. Um, for example, AI. Um, even bright people like Elon Musk are telling us that AI is gonna be one of the most profound dangers that the human race has ever experienced. I seriously doubt it. First of all, we get to put together 
the fundamentals on which AI operates. We get to put together the assumptions on which AI operates. Secondly, if AI is smart, there's no reason it will ever have the kind of urge toward usurpation and extermination that we humans have. Um, and in nature, when a new species comes along, it does not exterminate um, previous species. When multicellular creatures came along approximately a billion years ago, they did not exterminate unicellular creatures, one-celled creatures, not by any stretch of the imagination. They worked out synergistic deals with those previous levels of biological development. And those deals are so synergistic that right now you cannot, you cannot function without vast colonies of bacteria garrisoning your throat against invading microbes and especially garrisoning your gut. Um, there are hundreds and even thousands of different species of um, bacteria living in your gut. They do not live solitary lives. A bacterium lives in basically a mega city. Um, a bacterial colony the size of your palm is so thin that you can't see it, but it's got seven uh, trillion creatures, more than all the humans who have ever existed. And yet you have colony after colony after colony of these things. What are they there for? What are they good for? You have a synergistic relationship. You go down to the store and you buy yourself a package of chocolate eclairs. What you don't know when you get them home is that you cannot eat chocolate eclairs. It's the bacteria who eat the chocolate eclairs for you. And then the bacteria excrete um, glucose, which is food, fuel, mana from heaven for you. But without the bacteria, without the bacteria, you wouldn't be able to eat. You wouldn't be able to make vitamin P and vitamin K, for example, which those bacteria create for you. And without you to walk, to walk down to the store, to walk entire colonies of bacteria down to the store and to pick out chocolate eclairs, um, the bacteria would have nothing to eat. So is it likely that artificial intelligence is going to try to wipe us out when into artificial intelligence we hope will be more intelligent than we will and will be able to see these synergies we hope far more easily than we will? It is extremely unlikely. So again, it isn't um, the technologies that I fear, it's the ethicists. That's it. That's the entire presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Howard. This was a uh, really mind opening as usual. Now we have uh, a few minutes before uh, the next talk. Uh, uh, does anyone have questions for Howard? If you do, please uh, switch your microphone on and ask the question or uh, use the chat box. I'm going to give uh, 30 seconds for that. If nobody's fast no enough. Questions. Will... No, 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 no questions. The questions are where the Hold fun on. begins. Hold on. That's I where the intellectual to... ping pong balls Hold go on, back no. and I forth. I want to see if, uh, I mean, I'm giving uh, hey, priority to other people. OK. David. Hey, Howard, nice to see you. Ah, David. Um, isn't uh, an invasive species a counterexample to your contention that species don't wipe out other species? Uh, isn't which species? Invasive species. Oh, invasive species. No, in, uh, invasive species, to the best of my knowledge, um, leave room for other species um, as well. Now, David, I could be wrong because I'm not an expert on invasive species. What I've been noticing is that when we go goo and ga and ooh and ah, over the wonderful flora and uh, fauna, fauna and flora of places like Hawaii, what we're going over is invasive species because the Polynesians brought invasive species uh, approximately 1,000, 1,200 years ago um, to Hawaii. And invasive species have been um, taking advantage of everything from air currents and water currents to other species that will cart them around for as long as there's been life. I mean, how do we know that? Well, um, one of the privileges that Charles Darwin got out of his five-year 
Voyage of the Beagle was the privilege of visiting the Galapagos Islands, where things were totally and completely untouched by humans. And what did he study? He studied the lizards of the Galapagos Island. What are those things called again? Those iguanas um, of the Galapagos Island. Well, the iguanas of the Galapagos Island are not native to the Galapagos Island. Um, they came as an invasive species. Uh, it is supposed these days that they came on ocean currents a long time ago, but when they arrived, there were already species there. So virtually every one of the untouched landscapes that we look at and, uh, and admire because they are totally natural are filled with invasive species. And there's another word for this competition between invasive and native species that we've been talking about for the last 50 years. And it is evolution. Thank you, Howard. I think, unfortunately, we don't have uh, any more uh, time for ah. questions to Howard. Uh, uh, you know, I did have one, but uh, I'm going to email it to you. And I think okay. it's the start Good. of a nice conversation. Okay, right, well, have a wonderful conference. Thank you for inviting me. We'll see you all again soon. That's great. Uh, yes, I understand that uh, you have other commitments and you have to leave us. But again, thank you very much for the excellent talk. And see you soon uh, next time. Okay, thanks, Julia. Uh, Bye. I would uh, like now to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Julia Bassani. She's uh, a science fiction writer, one of the uh, a new generation of uh, science fiction writers who is writing fascinating things. I think she will say something about her books as well. I see that your microphone uh, is on, yes. Julia. Everyone am else, I, am I allowed to microphone? share my screen? Yes, you are. Can uh, I share yes. my screen? I have a presentation. I'm more comfortable with talking. Uh, with you. That's, not that's, a that's great. Please do share your screen. Okay. Let me see if. Let me know if you can see it. I see. Right. I see. Uh, your uh, beautiful. That's it. Perfect. Thank okay, you so much. Cool. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and to be talking about science fiction because I'm really interested in this theme, but I would like to introduce me uh, a bit more first. So first of all, I'm Italian. So if my English accent is weird, that's the reason why. Sorry for that. However, I'm studying to become an aerospace engineer. Um, at the Polytechnic University of Turin. And I'm also a writer. In fact, I've wrote two books, which I'm going to be telling you a bit, a little bit more about later. And I've been studying the feasibility of human missions to Mars for a few years now, um, because everything started when I was like 15 or 16 years old. And I took part in a space contest where I developed a project of a base on Mars. And basically everything started there and I got very passionate about this topic and I continue to, to study it and to learn more. And then I also wrote a book to try and apply that kind of knowledge. And now I am a research associate at the Blue Marble Space Institute for Science. And I'm working on a um, research project about developing and um, using sustainable technology in human um, bases on Mars or on the moon or in space in general. So this is my first book. I wrote it when I was 17 years old at Martin 12 and it is in fact a hard science fiction. So as I said, I, I took part in a space contest with the base on Mars. And after that contest, since I'm very passionate about writing and I'm Writing a book had always been one of my dreams. Um, I wanted to try and apply that knowledge about human missions to Mars in a story, in a real story. And so basically in that period, um, there were some sagas that were very um, popular among the younger generation. For example, um, the Hunger Games or Divergent or the Maze Runner um, and, and such things basically. So what I wanted to, to try and do was um, 
make a story that was entertaining like that for for young people for boys and girls but have it based on mars set on mars um and in a in a kind of scientific environment so that people uh, could read and at the same time learn something because what's really interesting about books and reading in general is that when we read we completely enter the story and we start to do what the characters do and know what the characters know and feel what the characters feel so if they are in a in an actual scientific background i'm not sure how to explain that basically we we, we will learn more about that world and this was what i was trying to do so basically the plot is um we have the first human beings ever born on mars that are teenagers and they, they were in fact born and brought up on Mars inside the base where the crew of astronauts is, is their only family. The problem is that they have no contact with planet, planet Earth even though they know that the rest of humanity is out there. So they have a completely different point of view on the whole um, universe, I would say, and on humanity and on space exploration because they're on Mars and they start wondering, why are we here? Why were we born here? What are we doing? And so they start going to find the answers to the solutions, uh, to, the, to this question, sorry, embarking on an adventure and breaking some rules because that's what teenagers do. The problem is that um, Mars is quite a dangerous place where, break, where to break the rules. So doing it might be um, fatal or anyway, pretty dangerous in any case. So what I was trying to do was in fact, teaching while entertaining or entertaining while teaching. Um, having a, a, an enthralling story and teach something about space flight. And it kind of worked based on what the readers told me. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> The second book that I wrote um, is Calopsia, and this is an actually this isn't a science fiction, um, but the the concept and the, the mindset that I that I applied to write is pretty similar. So I wanted to say a word on this too, because um, so since I'm studying aerospace engineering. Um, Obviously, I fell in love with aviation as well, and in particular, military aviation. So what I was trying to do with this book was to um, bring the readers into my world of um, this passion for aviation. And so kind of tell a story that could be relatable to boys and girls of my same age and, and bring them in my world so that they could be passionate about, the, about aviation and see it the way I saw it. If that, if that makes sense. So the protagonist is a teenage girl that is training to become a military pilot. It's a bit weird because it's a it's set in a dystopian world that doesn't really exist. I invented it all so that it could just serve to the plot. But um, this is quite different because uh, I wrote it when I was 20 years old, so a little bit older than the first one. And it's more like, um, it's more like deep, uh, as in emotional, emotionally, I would say, um, because I, I wanted really to, to grasp the attention and uh, I, I'm not even sure how to say it exactly. Um, but basically I, I was trying to, I mean, with, with the new sensibility that I had at 20 years old, I was trying to, to grasp, grasp the attention towards other things and still have the readers um, kind of learn more and get fascinated by the whole world of airplanes, which is basically more or less what we want to do with science through science fiction. So exactly, how do we approach a young public through fiction? This is something that I've been thinking about a lot because it's something that I'm trying to achieve myself. And here is something that I, immediately thought when I first tried to, to face this issue. And it is, if Harry Potter, for example, was based on science instead of magic, and if it was kind of realistic, imagine how many young people would have been influenced to um, learn more on the matter and to, uh, you know, get closer to science. Because it's crazy, but 
the Harry Potter is absolutely detailed and accurate about magic. And when you read it, it seems like you actually learn something about magic, which is something that doesn't exist. And so it's crazy. I mean, imagine if that was science. It, it will have, I, get, I think, such a great impact. So after thinking about that, I immediately thought about Star Wars somehow, because Star Wars is a science fiction that, um, I mean, it's pretty successful and many people um, like it and enjoy it. I mean, I mean, among the, the younger public. And so uh, I, I asked a question to my mother and I asked her, if she, if when she was young, she liked Star Wars, the first movies that, that came out. And she said me, she told me yes. And I told her, why did you like Star Wars? And she told me for the actors. Of course, obviously that plays a major role, um, of course. But okay, she also told me the people who were passionate about Star Wars back then were actually passionate about the science fiction of those fields because um, it was the first time that there were particular effects and so people were more passionate about it. But then of course that wasn't real science because of course Star Wars isn't real science even though we're, we're starting, it, it's, it's more science that, than Harry Potter if we want to say that. Um, so I asked her if, if Star Wars was based on, on, on actual science somehow, do you think you would have been more interested in learning more about that science? And she told me yes. And she told me maybe it should have been a bit more like the Martian. And the Martian, the way we know it, it's um, a, a very particular science fiction that is, it's very, very realistic, even not entirely, but it's really close to reality. The problem with the Martian is that the aim of the public is more adult, more than um, I would say the younger generations, which is the goal I would say if we wanted to if we want to um, approach younger people to science. So, what is the goal that we should achieve? It should be to write great fiction that will be enthralling regardless of their circumstances and have it based on real science. So what I grasped for, from the Harry Potter, which is just an example, but it made me understand quite a few things, is that we need to write stories that are relatable for the younger generations. And Harry Potter happens to be incredibly relatable for young people because we have these students that go to school and things happen and there are many, many themes that are faced in these books that are very relatable, even though there is magic. But that same way we can set a story with more scientific background and scientific research um, as, a, as a groundwork. Because I think this way, when, when a young reader would um, follow the characters through their stories and feeling like them, they will, they will enter this world and learn more about it. So how do we, how do we make um, the stories more relatable for the young, for the young generations um, of today? I think we should face some, uh, some current important themes, like for example, climate, environment, gender equality, violence and harassment, poverty and lack of education, terrorism, and I would say also quarantine, since we are in this period and quarantine is particular because for example, astronauts in space are obviously in quarantine. So that, that's also pretty relatable. Um, these are some of the themes, but there are so many. And I think um, trying to, um, I would say hide or involve these themes in, in books that, that are based on science and still have enthralling stories this would really grasp the attention of, of the young generation that would be, um, how can I say, dragged into the stories and, and find themselves learning more about science and become curious about science. And I think this is, this is the, the goal that we should have and what's, what will be really important, I think. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that was it. 
Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, is again, uh, does anyone have questions for Julia? Chalakanya, uh, is what you wrote in the chat a question for Julia? Uh, I don't know, but maybe it is. So, Julia, could you read the, the text yeah. in the chat and yeah, say something to... about that? They said it's for everyone, however. Just answer it. Yeah, that's interesting about modern physics and alchemy. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not really a question, it's just a point yeah right any other question for julia yes uh, julio uh, it's also not a question but uh, a comment uh, when you talk about uh, calopsia and you talk about uh, uh, military aviation what uh, you like it so much uh, I think that uh, is a, an important point because we thinking in advance to other um, uh, other talks today about uh, politics and importance of the state in the futurist uh, civilization. Um, I think that uh, all people who consider ourselves as cosmists, uh, we are basically uh, pacifist people. But pacifist is not need to be naive. So I think that it's very important and very realistic to have that point of view that you have, uh, Julia, about those things uh, related to, to defense that mm -hmm. uh, will be uh, an important item in the state and in the uh, civilization of of the future. That is the, the comment. Thank you. Yes, I would just say like my passion for military aviation is more related to um, I would say the technicality and the engineering behind those aerospace machines because as I study aerospace engineering that's the way I see it and then it also brings a conflict to the story that it's interesting to explore literally speaking. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I think this was uh, fascinating, Julia. Really, uh, you know, appreciate your talk. And you made some excellent points about, uh, uh, you know, the Harry Potter analogy I thought was just great. You know, it's, 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 it, it, and, and I think we can get that passion for science going. Um, and, and, you know, in media and awareness and for young people. I think um, something that's missing or, 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 or maybe something that I, I could add to this is just the, um, the effects on the mind, the brain, and, uh, you know, the, the, the psychological aspects of, of being in space and getting people interested in that. And uh, um, what, what one, one thing I'd like to bring up is, is um, the uh, you know the, uh, the 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 movie you know we've got a uh, an astronaut on Mars who's raising plants to survive and he never talked to the plants. I thought that was I thought that was weird and I thought they were missing a huge opportunity for him to just get really weird because you know like a anybody especially if you're a botanist if you're in space and all you had are these little plant babies you're going to start to treat them like humans. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, that, that kind of, uh, you know, the awareness of, of uh, you know, our interconnectedness and maybe hallucinogens becoming more accept, accepted in society and then going back to uh, na native roots and ayahuasca ceremonies and these kinds of things happening in space are fascinating to me. So anyway. Yeah, I agree, totally agree. Other questions? So I have a quick one. You mentioned some uh, features that uh, science fiction aimed that uh, young people should have. 
And uh, could you give us some example of that? Perhaps some young writers whom uh, we should read besides you, of course. I actually, I'm afraid I don't know other young writers right now. I'm looking for them as well, but I, I, don't, I don't personally know any other young writers. <laughs> Let's uh, all uh, look uh, for them. No? Other questions for Julia? We could go for some old old writers too. I mean, there's so so much historical science fiction over the years, and I think what I think we all realize that we we may hit a point as a species where age doesn't matter anymore, and so you know, my, or youth could be sort of you know looked at differently, and uh, we could be drawing on uh, you know this huge knowledge base that's out there. So I guess there is no other questions following this talk. And uh, uh, I'm supposed to follow with the next speaker, who is uh, Philip van Ederwelde. Uh, but uh, I've been thinking that uh, perhaps uh, if uh, the following speaker, who is Yalda Moussaminia, wants to switch places with Philippe, that uh, could also be an option. So let me just ask Yalda if she is here. Yes. I, see, I think she is because she switched her uh, welcome on. So Yalda, how about uh, trading places with Philippe? Yeah, that works for me. That works for you. Okay, that works for Philippe and that works for me. And I think that works uh, for everyone. So I'd like to introduce uh, Yalda Moussavini, who is a, an activist in, uh, in uh, space, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, decentralized uh, autonomous organizations, all sorts of uh, futurist social experiments that uh, could uh, make our life better one day soon enough. Mm. Let me just ask everyone else to mute their microphone. And uh, Yalda, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna try sharing my screen now. Um, mm -mm. Share screen, desktop. Okay. You can see this okay, everyone? Um, Yes, so the the name of this uh, talk is kind of a statement um, and uh, it's a, we need a new counterculture movement if we want freedom, privacy, peace, and self-actualization. Um, I spend uh, a lot of my time thinking about both dystopia and utopia um, and a lot of a lot of it, a lot, a lot of these thoughts and ideas do come from you know, science fiction, um, reading or watching um, these different dystopias. Well, in modern sci-fi, um, most portrayal of the, the future is highly dystopian. Um, but, you know, we did have a period of, uh, of Star Trek where, you know, there were still, you know, exploring, uh, sometimes, you know, in, encountering different species and there being conflicts and that sort of thing. But in general, um, you know, Earth was like a very futuristic place and Earth was a more like united uh, uh, planet. And uh, there was the United Federation of Planets. So I am very, very inspired by, um, by that like Roddenberry's portrayal of the future and um, of, of, of a more like, you know, united uh, world. Um, I guess a little bit of background about me in general. Um, I was born in California, um, but my parents, they're from Iran. They, they came to Iran. I mean, they came from Iran to California in the late 1970s but actually um, both of them have recently moved back to Iran. 
Um, I lived in California for most of my life. And then um, a couple of years ago, I started to feel more like disconnected with um, the technology scene there that I was working in in Silicon Valley. And I uh, moved to Berlin. Um, I've been working in the cryptocurrency industry. And I started to feel like the the mentality in in Europe and in Berlin seemed more uh, progressive than um, what I sense is more of like a hyper capitalist um, mode of production that was in San Francisco and Silicon Valley where I was living. Um, so I moved to Berlin um, because I've been, I guess, just trying to follow like uh, brain waves that kind of feel more on this like utopian post-capitalism, uh, post-money path versus the just like keeping the machine going uh, of like what I feel is more of like this like dystopian world that is being um, funded and created by, uh, you know, the venture capitalists and uh, in Silicon Valley and throughout kind of like sugarcoated as, oh, we want to make the world a better place. But then, um, but then I, I think that there are fundamentally a lot of things that people should be doing if they really believe that, that they aren't when it comes to creating businesses. Um, and I think that that um, that that relates to uh, actually like the business structure that you choose. I think that traditional corporations, where you're not giving your workers a voice, where you're not giving people like a, like a vote, like a ownership. I think that um, that is basically what what is holding us back partially towards getting towards more of. A, post-capitalist states of work. So I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a person who believes a lot in cooperatives, cooperative businesses, cooperative principles. Um, and in my mind, that is what I think are, is, is one of the solutions that we need whenever it comes to business and whenever it comes to how we want to transform business. And um, in addition to cooperatives, I think that, you know, nonprofits are very important because, you um, I, I guess I'm, I'm leaning more towards uh, the path of, uh, you know, it's not, not trusting the government to, to fully solve our problems, but starting to think for, well, how can we create these non-governmental, global, large-scale nonprofits that can actually get to the, the systemic root of a lot of our issues, which are global, and that's why it's like we, if we try to solve problems as a single country, we know that that doesn't get us there, um, get us like as further as as far as we need. So, so, so throughout throughout like the past four years, I've been working in this like cryptocurrency ecosystem, and um, and one of the one of the reasons that I started actually researching more, um, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, was because of a, a, an article that Julia wrote who invited me to this talk. Um, we had a project together um, called Space Decentral, and that's about creating a, a space agency that is for the people, by the people, um, and you know, powered by blockchain and cryptocurrency as a way to make decisions and share value as a, as a global network. Um, that, that idea like, um, was, was proposed around 2017. And I think that it was ahead of, ahead of the time, um, back then, but I think, um, right around now, you know, in like 2021, uh, I, I'm starting to kind of sense and observe that we are getting closer to, I hope, you know, that vision starting to come to life. Um, and throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk more about like the evolution of um, of that idea of creating a a decentralized uh, citizen led uh, space program. Um, so what I think is the is going to be one of the first steps to get us in that direction, um, which is this uh, this new project that um, that I'm working on now um, called Azimuth. Um, and it's an engine to help minimize uh, dystopian futures. Um, so it's a it's a new or recurring event um, that will first start taking place solely in the virtual world. Um, but then in the post-pandemic future, I'm hoping that it will start to have a more physical 
real world component. Um, and the first event is actually going to be next week and it's very uh, last minute. It's, it's, we haven't even started promoting yet because there are so many different moving parts, but um, actually the announcement will be happening later today. Um, but it's inspired by ancient symposiums where music and performance was more integrated with intellectual discourse. Um, so back in 2008, um, I, you know, I was, I was living in San Francisco and I was also, uh, or two, 2006, 2007, it was just like, there was like the, like a, like a music scene there, like a lot of people that are, you know, DJs or in like bands and throwing raves, this like this kind of countercultural scene that I was a part of there. And I think for most of my life, I've been trying to figure out like, how can, how can we actually bring together the arts community more with the technology community. It's like, how, how can this happen? Because I think that, that if we can combine these two, we can actually start, we can, we can start real movements or real movements again. Like, like there was, I think that there was more of this, um, this merger between the arts and technology um, during the days when the internet was created. And so it's like, I, I guess I read about like the history of the internet and the counterculture. And I, I wasn't, um, I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't alive then to, to live through it fully. Um, but I think I dream of it just like I, I dream about space. So, um, so this, um, this event is kind of my attempt at trying to recreate what I think uh, what like that, that that spirit of like the the early days of the internet where whenever you create events it's not it's it's about like kind of bringing people together sharing ideas like doing like a cross collaboration of industries and um and people and especially like you know how, how can we like merge merge the arts more with technology for to inspire people um so one of the things that we're gonna have we're calling this like at this event like the Cosmosis Space Opera. Um, it's a it's like what is a space opera? It's a subgenre of science fiction that emphasizes space warfare, melodramatic adventure, inter interplanetary battles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think that like the world we live in right now, it actually is it is a like a space opera. It's very uh, there are all these different you know forces going on, and we're trying to kind of navigate through it. So we're saying it's like the cosmos is space opera, but in some ways it's kind of the space opera that we are currently living in. And I think it's very you know kind of like oh the Galactic Federation, these sorts of things. It's like okay, wow, like this is uh, this is reality. Um, and, the, and the way that it's going to work, we don't know, like, this is like the longer term vision. It's, an, it's still like a lot, of it, a lot of the pieces are still coming together, but, um, but we want to do something where, um, like, like where there will be an exquisite corpse type method where each collaborator um, is, uh, they, they know a component of the story and then they add their piece to it, um, but they still have their kind of independent autonomous universe of their artists and, and of like the creativity that they're getting. Um, and then there will there will be like different sequences for how we do the, the transitions as well. Um, so yeah, I guess it's, it's called cosmosis because it's like cosmos, the universe as a well-ordered whole, osmosis, like usually an effortless but often unconscious assimilation of information and then gnosis, knowledge of spiritual mysteries and an altered state of consciousness which bypasses the conscious mind. Um, and that's the other thing that we do want to kind of uh, bring, bring to light more in this event is, is creating a, a, a sort of forum where we do, where it is like, okay, to start to, to talk about the, the unknown, to talk about, you know, religion, but to also like, just like bring people together that usually don't like talking about it, that where they're very uncomfortable, they're very like secretive, private about it and kind of help, help people also kind of break outside of that mold because I think that in like the scientific and engineering community, you know, that is sometimes it's like very taboo um, to talk about these different topics, but artists, they explore and they talk about a lot of like these topics a lot much more comfortably. Um, but it's very fascinating, like, uh, like how uncomfortable a lot of people are when it comes to actually talking about what your perception of the universe is. 
and what your perception of like reality is. Um, so I've, I've always been very interested in how do we open up that conversation more? Because I think that that is a, a, a component of like countercultural shifts and, and ideas and like just how like the world works. It's like, we should be having these conversations. These are the most important conversations that we should be talking about and starting to reach like new global uh, consensus on. Um, um, so yeah, I guess it's like the, the other thing about this cosmosis space opera, it's a futuristic battle between the polarities of light and dark as we are accelerated into the future. Um, so the musical performers and other participants will decipher cosmic information downloads to best suit their aims and um, choosing to either ascend to a new age or descending deeper into darkness. That's That copy there is a bit of uh, 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 too dystopian and, and cryptic, but but I guess the way that I think that the world and and consciousness works um, is like, you know, I, I like I'm someone who has like studied engineering, but I also do you know write poems and try to make music, and I think that a lot of us a lot of us have that um, have have that that creative that that artists within us, but we don't really allow access to it just because, and this is a symptom basically of, of work and kind of like just people being uh, so exhausted to like work like all oh, these deep work weeks and just, you know, make money, make money that like you like just lose touch with your actual like higher self and your being and like the creative part of you. And I think that's basically like, like, like maybe a, a worse pan, like one of a, a, a different kind of pandemic that is going on in the world. Um, but, but I think that like, uh, it's like, how, how can we actually allow like more people to realize that they do have an artist within them? Um, like, I hope that we can start to kind of inspire that with, with this event and this conversations and starting to bring together um, the arts and um, and like scientific or engineering or skeptical communities more. Um, so let's see. I, I've been talking for. Is that, has it been like fifteen or twenty minutes so far? How much? How am I looking for time? Just take all the time you want. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the, the different components that this is going to have is uh, live musical performances, throughout theatrical videos, chats. Um, talks and interviews and um, and uh, it's gonna start to take place in this like sort of metaverse like environment that's called Asterisk. Um, so we'll have, you know, different like, like art gallery and then you'll go in there and then there'll be like a portal that you take to start to go to the, ta the, the stage where the, um, the live music is happening. Um, and, and the other uh, component um, longer term component. I'm not sure if this will happen for the first event, but basically a lot of times, you know, you, you might go to a conference and um, someone's like giving a talk and they're like, oh, okay, like, you know, maybe you'll follow up and collaborate with that person, maybe not, but we want to make, make it like easier uh, for, for that pathway to happen, to kind of have people that are working on technology projects or nonprofits that we're curating that we think are important and then um, allow pathways for participants to then get more involved in those projects or you know, donate money to them, what have you. So it's just kind of like, how, how, can, we, um, how can we actually create like very like uh, constructive and action oriented environments and, uh, and encourage this more like cross collaboration, you know, melding of uh, ideas and what have you. Um, and so one of the things that, um, that I, think that I, I think is like the one of uh, I guess like this is the like let's talk, let's talk more about like the financial component of this event and of this conference um, like I wish that uh, just didn't have to like figure out ways to make money and you can just do these events and it's amazing and it's awesome um, but I think that until as we still exist in this uh, this system of capital and needing to kind of pay for things and pay for food, you know, we're not in that utopia yet. We we need to have we need to kind of figure out a program that can start to get us there. Um, so um, so I've, so I've wanted to like design something where 
we can start to basically generate revenue, but without having to raise money from venture capitalists or to like give away like ownership of the project to um, to like external people that aren't directly involved. So, so I guess that's the good thing about organizing a virtual event because like the, at least like the costs are pretty low. Um, and it's like, you can just really experiment with um, if you can offer people like a, like something that they might find value in. Um, and if they keep coming, then you're like, okay, well maybe you, um, you also figure out a new way to distribute the revenue with the artists involved too, like the musicians. Um, in the traditional festival world, like, you know, whenever you're, you're booking an artist or a DJ, you just kind of like give a fee, like a flat fee, you don't do a profit share. Um, but we, what, what we want to do is something different is the profit will be shared with the artists, with the technologists. Um, so you are starting to, to not, not, not have it as, oh, the, the artists or performers are like an agent to the business and then they get the money. It's like, no, it's like, it's actually trying to, trying to bring people more together. And um, because I think that like you, we need to kind of be more in touch with the arts, with the critics, with people that actually, um, yeah, no, think more about like ethics and that sort of thing too, as we design like these future technological systems that are more aligned with our human rights. Um, so it's like, that's, that's basically like, I think that one of the problems with technology today is they're designed for, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the technology, it prioritizes profit as opposed to our human rights, you know, but we use it because it's just, everyone does the, you know, they just build the same patterns, data collection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but more and more, it's just like, we're just kind of like giving away a lot of our freedom for this like convenience. But I think that we need to basically break away from that. And the only way that we can break away from that is if, um, is if the stakeholders involved in this like collective, this enterprise are not in it to maximize profits, but they're in it to make sure that the technology roadmap of the future is aligned with our human rights. So it's like, okay, you can have a for-profit type component, but it is a social enterprise at the end of the day. Um, it recognizes that traditional like profit maximizing modes of doing business, building technology, et cetera, will not get us to the future that we need to um, get to. Um, so this initial like, uh, um, system that uh, that like we had to come up with a system very quickly because this, this was like kind of rushed together. It's very uh, uh, I guess flat in the beginning. It, it'll probably change a little bit, but for each participant that, that was involved, we were like, okay, well, which which tier do you think you fall in? And a tier roughly amounts to like how many hours they think it's going to take for them to do their part, um, whether it's uh, w whether it's an act or whether it's um, it's like building some code. Um, and then we'll, we basically just, then you have like the team of the different people, the tiers, and then if the event turns a profit, then you know, everyone involved will, um, will get a little slice of that. So that's, that's one experiment we're doing. Something we're not really going to be advertising or anything because we're not, um, but I'm just, you know, sharing this in this uh, meeting right now, because it's more about like um, a, a potential like solution for how we can start to kind of think about, you know, money and um, mon money differently whenever it comes to events. And, um, and then you basically can like create then stronger incentives with the collective of people to then spread the word about the event, et cetera, because then everyone is a, is a stakeholder. So that is one of the, the financial experiments we're gonna be doing. We'll see if it works or if it doesn't work, but um, yeah. So that was just an overview of, um, of Azimuth and, um, and yeah, so this is basically, uh, I, I feel like I started to have ideas for something like this back in 2008. And it's basically taken about 12 years to figure out like how to really do it right. And to, to, ins to inspire the right team to kind of come together to do it. And unfortunately, like the, the pandemic in some ways, like, I don't know if, if this wouldn't have happened, if, if we if we have if we weren't in this like lockdown mode so it's very it's very weird you know in some ways or that or it's a, it's very weird where it seems like you're like something like your dream project was only maybe possible because of this 
very unfortunate thing in the world. Um, but here, <laughs> and, that, and I guess that is the conclusion for, for this talk. <laughs> Are there any questions? Let me know. Thank you very much, Yalda. Well, uh, can you just read the, the question in the chat box from uh, oh, yes. Comedian? In the meantime, I will uh, be making a couple of comments. So uh, you read the question, then you read it aloud, and then uh, you comment. It's an interesting one. Uh, oh, uh, Yalda has invited me to participate in the first uh, version of this uh, azimuth thing. First time I asked that, okay, what? Is it about, she explained it to me and I didn't understand. So I asked her again and again to explain it to me and uh, I didn't understand. Uh, I have enjoyed this talk very much, but I'm afraid to say that perhaps I still don't understand what it is exactly that Yalda wants to do, but that's not a bad thing. You know, as they say, things, uh, good things, happen when we are uh, kind of uh, pushed out of our comfort zone. This definitely pushes me out of my comfort zone, but uh, I'll do my best to contribute and to do everything that uh, Yalda will uh, ask me to do. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone to think of other questions for Yalda. And in the meantime, uh, perhaps you can read and discuss the question of Cometan. Yes, so um, the question says, uh, in Astronism, we see religion, spirituality, philosophy as being central to establishing the foundations of space exploration. Does my own spiritual or religious identity connect to outer space or space exploration? Yes, 100% for sure. And I think that that's maybe one thing that I didn't get too deep on in the in the talk, but I, I, I very much aligned with, I, I think that it's, it is our nature to want to explore and see the stars because I think that, um, well, well, I mean, I guess my, my conception of, uh, of like, what is like, like my, my soul and like where my soul comes from. Like, I, I think that it, it's like connect, it's like, it, it comes from something before me being born on earth. So it is connected to the cosmos. So I think that I, 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 I always try to question, it's like, why do I have this deep desire to leave this planet? I'm like, is it is it because of something like deeper in my soul or is it because I've watched all this sci-fi? And that's something that I'm trying to kind of figure out day by day if I've been programmed by the media to want to leave this planet or if it's just kind of my the human nature of my DNA. <laughs> But I feel very much programmed uh, to want to, to, to explore outer space. There is uh, another question in the chat. There are other two, as a matter of fact, in read and comment. Um, I've... I, I am familiar with um, Burning Man events, communities, but I'm not I'm not that connected to uh, I guess a lot of the people that organize um, you know Burning Man events or communities. Um, I was starting to like I just wanted to start at like a very um, initial level of like okay who who are who are um, the artists that I want to start to just showcase or who are like the speakers that I want to start to showcase. And like, I've just been focusing a lot on the curation of that um, as opposed to seeing like, oh, who are people that have done virtual events that I can learn from for how to do it better. So um, I've just been so, so focused in the curation and like with like the time, like I really wanted to do this event on December 20th, 21st. Um, actually, one, one thing that I didn't get too deep into in the, the talk was, uh, um, so in Iran, there's the winter solstice, they call the winter solstice uh, event Shabe Yalda, the night of Yalda. So I was, I was named after the winter solstice, but I didn't want to put my name on this event, but 
um, but the but it, it is about like uh, exploring light and dark and uh, so it's like it was very important to just try to see if we can make this event happen on the 20th but we haven't even started promoting it um, so um, it's and, and that's why it's just like okay well uh, we will have succeeded in at least bring these awesome people together that, um, and we'll, we'll see what happens after that. So, I mean, I already feel like it is a success because of all these amazing people have agreed to be a part of it. And, um, yeah, so, but I think that in 2021, hopefully there's more time to make things even better. There's another interesting uh, question about what should one do on a personal level to end up in a utopia? <laughs> what should one do on a personal level to end up in a utopia? Um, I think first, um, believing that it is possible. Um, second, starting to uh, to create, like just be a part of a, a community, create a community on earth that is kind of like one. So that's the other path that I'm trying to figure out as far as the physical world is, um, like I said, I'm very inspired by the 60s counterculture and like back to land movement, whole earth catalog. I'm just like, you know, trying to search right now for where, where to kind of start to create this like alternative community and like create something like the Black Mountain College. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that we should just start to create pockets of utopia on earth. It's so possible. Um, like we need to just like learn, I, I want to like learn how to grow food and um, that sort of thing. So that's like this other kind of calling I have right now. It's like I, for the past few years, a lot of it was like space, but now I'm like, okay, well, if you want to build a spaceport, you need some, some place on earth. So uh, where, where is that land going to be on earth where it's not just like you're building a traditional headquarters for a company or a rocket launch company, but you're building really like an alternative, like futuristic community. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, what Elon Musk is doing for space, it's, it's, it's good. It's important. You know, it inspired me in a lot of ways, but then whenever I see the news about like how the, the rockets are going to be used to like transport weapons, like, I'm just like, what, like this, this like military industrial complex of space exploration. I'm like, I think that we need like a company that, that is a space company that's not part of the military industrial complex like that is just pure that does not in the business of killing other humans you know so that's just like what I that's why I'm like I was talking a lot before about like my nationality before it's like okay I was born in America my parents are from Iran I was living in Germany and now I'm in like Ibiza I'm like I don't fucking have a nationality I don't I don't know. I'm just like, I'm a human. So whenever I, you see like China going to the moon and they're like putting the flag on, I'm like, really? We're still stuck in this kind of flag waving world. I'm like, that's not how you get to get to Star Trek. Like, <laughs> so I'm just trying to figure out like, okay, like just the, what is the human? I'm, I feel like I'm a human. Like I do have like ties to like, yeah, America and Iran, but like, I'm like, I can't, like, I, I don't have a flag that I'm waving. Like, so that's that's where I feel kind of frustrated right now with like this kind of like utopia. I'm like, okay, well, where where is it going to be on Earth if I'm going to start to create a community? I'm like, where where do I belong? I don't know. <laughs> trying to figure that out. Other questions for you? Okay. Do some. We will be allowed to have our own. Okay. Uh, may I, I ask, or you you have more more questions in the chat first? Um, there was a question that was sent to me in private. Was that for for me to answer publicly? No, it's to everyone. The okay. one from Chaitanya is to everyone. Oh, do some of us is that for is that question for me? I think it is. Allowed to have our own sandbox. In, uh, in the metaverse? Yes, yeah, so, um, so the goal with, uh, with this metaverse is, um, is definitely this, uh, is, yeah, how, 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 how other people, it's, I, I think of it like kind of like the comic book world, like uh, if you think of um, DC, 
or what's it called the you know like avengers or something where it's just like you have like one comic that kind of brings together a lot of other people's stories but then people do have their like own universes too so i think that 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 is what i see as kind of like the future vision of this is like people can start to have like different like brands and and identities for their universes or or their way of of or their their thinking of like um of like what what reality is like and then you you also like start to encourage like different people to to come together and create and converge uh new realities so yeah definitely that is uh the longer term vision um and uh i guess the other thing that i didn't get a chance to get into was um was what I think the future of, uh, of creating a decentralized space program will be. And I think that will be more of a game. Like right now you have EVE Online or Kerbal Space Program, these very popular space games with lots of users, but people are spending all this time like working on these games, but they're not actually like, it's just like a game. It's like, but it's like, wait, what if it was like a game but the different things people were working and building on actually then contributed to something real. So I think that is where the future is headed in the next few years. And I see that connected to the same like metaverse like world where you're creating things that are like really simulating real physics, really, really simulating real space missions. And that's how you start to kind of draw attention to them and then draw funding to them. Um, because like people can start to experience them and it's cheaper to build and prototype in the virtual world and then offer experiences through like media or storytelling. I think we have uh, time for uh, two more questions to Yada. Mm, in the meantime, uh, do you have a website where uh, one can uh, read uh, about uh, the progress that you're making? with uh, this azimuth thing um there is a website um that it's it we're going to be plugging in a way to get some whoops tickets later azimuth.voyage yes yes so it's it's very basic right now but it's kind of under production um but if you go there uh, in the next 24 hours there'll, there will start, start to be more information for putting your name on an email list or to purchase a, a ticket, etc. That's a good one. Another point, you uh, discussed a lot how people should uh, participate in uh, this kind of uh, next generation initiatives. But, uh, you know, so many people, they have so many things to do. They don't have any special skill. They don't especially like to interact with uh, big communities i think many people just want to follow something watch something uh, be uh, told interesting things what uh, do you have to offer to this kind of people who and for who i believe do represent the majority of people yeah so i mean it's it'll be s similar to a conference where you can go and listen and you don't have to say anything so um so there, there is always that component for more of the observer like person. Um, and then people can, can uh, be a part of it for the entertainment or the learning. And then if you choose later, you want to also be a part of one of the projects, you could go down that path, but you don't have to. <laughs> I think uh, Ruben wants to say something. Yes, thank you, Julio. It's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, well, uh, your talk, uh, Janda, is very inspiring in a lot of themes, and I I want to take um, that of uh, the importance of thinking in the development development of art in um, in futurism, because uh, we have no doubt about the, the exponential progress of technology, but. We need people like you that is thinking about uh, the development of art together with technology, because art will be needed for uh, having a happy future, for having a joyful future for humanity. If we have an asymmetry between the development of technology and the development of art, 
we will be in danger of not having so happy future. And you talk also about other so important themes like cooperativism, no profits organizations, crypto, and the financial model. The financial model is so important because uh, surely in any future that we arrive, we will need to have a job and there will be the need for uh, work politics, for work laws and that financial model. I don't know if it will be post-capitalism or capitalism or, or how it will be, but we will need a model and that is also so, so important. And finally, uh, uh, when I talk about the, the talk uh, of Juli, uh, Julia in the previous, and we talk about uh, military and defense and, and so on and pacifism, uh, I, when, when I talk about defense, I were, were not thinking in human troubles between humans, but other uh, concept of defense, as you uh, talk also in space opera, uh, we don't know if we are alone in the universe, so uh, defense will uh, be important in that uh, way, not in conflict between humans. <laughs> very, very good point, and thank you for the comments. So thank you very much, Yalda. And now I will uh, hand over to the next speaker. Well, uh, the next speaker is someone whose name is often mentioned in connection to all kinds of uh, emerging as futuristic technologies. Philippe van der Veld has been uh, very active in uh, different sectors like virtual reality, nanotechnology, and of course, space. Uh, over to you, Philippe. Thank you, Julio. So I'm going to present uh, with some slides. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. If uh, you can make it full screen at your end, that will enable you to see it, uh, to see the slides in full detail. So my talk will be about the meeting of two cultures, you could say, and it is about cyberspace meeting outer space. Or uh, an alternative title of my talk is what is happening at the intersection of social virtual reality, also known as multi-user virtual worlds and the building of the metaverse and cyberspace as the, the previous speaker has uh, spoken about and new space, which is the name given to the space industry that is uh, today with the new impetus that um, SpaceX and others uh, and Blue Origin by Bezos have given to the entire space field and the return to the moon and Mars and all of that. Yet another title uh, of this talk is that it is the true story of how the space settlement movement, a cultural phenomenon, is merging with the cyberspace settlement uh, movement. So. I would like to tell you this story by means of the life story or using that as a thread uh, of someone who is and has always been a member of both of these movements and subcultures, namely me. Uh, on the left, this is me back when I had hair. And so um, thank you, Julio, for your introduction earlier. Um, I am indeed a 30-year veteran of the virtual reality industry. That's my bread and butter uh, business. I am the founder and CEO of eSpaces, which is, to my knowledge, the world's oldest continuously operated virtual reality studio. And I have also been a lifelong space buff. Here you see me on the arm of my late father, um, in 1969, my father made sure and told me several times um, that he made sure that I would witness with my own eyes 
on the television live as it happened, Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon and making this historic uh, leap forward for mankind. So, of course, I wanted to be an astronaut. Of course, I ever since have uh, aspired to go to space and settle space and explore space. Fast forward to when I was uh, 12 and um, I joined the local space and astronomy club uh, called uh, Sirius. And there, uh, within a year after um, my joining it, in uh, 1980, I founded my first organization, the Belgian Space Information Center. And so um, I also, um, not long thereafter, in 1981, uh, started dabbling as a precocious space journalist. And this is my very first uh, published article, which was an interview with uh, Fred Hayes, astronaut Fred Hayes in uh, 1981, uh, published nationally in Belgium. So um, this slide I'm going to skip. Uh, in 1982, almost uh, the same year, William Gibson coined in uh, his uh, short story, Burning Chrome, and later uh, he expanded on it in uh, Neuromancer, he coined the word, the word cyberspace. And he said that it, he described it as a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators, a graphical representation of data abstracted from the banks of every computer in the human system, unthinkable complexity, lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data. I read uh, those novels back then and was enormously inspired by them. Uh, in parallel, I was also dabbling with amateur rocketry. This is me launching one of those uh, Estes uh, space shuttle uh, rocket kits. And then uh, fast forward still, uh, at the end of my secondary education, I wasn't even 17 years old. I published my very first international article in English in astronomy magazine uh, of May 1986. It was a title, uh, so the, the piece was uh, mentioned on the cover, and this was the spread of the piece. My, I basically gave an overview of Europe's place in space, what is Europe doing in space flight, and uh, where does Europe belong in the, in the space race at that time? or there wasn't any space race at the time. But um, a year later, so this is 1986, a year later, um, I saw in a newsstand this issue of Scientific American, uh, which published, uh, this was really the coming out of virtual reality as a technology uh, with showing the data glove on the cover of, um, of uh, Scientific American. And so that inspired me in, in, with, with all that I had read in uh, William Gibson and in science fiction, that inspired me to go and study up and, and read up on this technology uh, from the moment I saw it in Scientific American. To my delight, I, I noticed, I learned that uh, it is actually NASA who is at the uh, cradle or who uh, inspired the modern form of virtual reality with headsets because they contracted with a, a company called VPL uh, to make the data glove and the headset in order to uh, use virtual reality for and develop virtual reality for the training of astronauts, uh, especially for EVAs. And on the right of this uh, slide, you see a, um, a female astronaut in the ISS using a VR headset uh, for some experiments. So uh, NASA has kept using virtual reality ever since. And so they use these uh, neutral buoyancy uh, rigs and tanks for 
uh, doing e EVA training, but they also do EVA training this way without going all the way into the uh, uh, spacesuit and in the in the in the water tank, but using the highest uh, uh, quality uh, virtual reality headsets. These are very bulky ones because they are some years old, and that's how bulky they needed to be in order to have relatively high resolution graphics. So. Moving on, in uh, 1992, um, I was at university by that time. Um, and no, actually, I had already left uh, university uh, and was uh, just out of my military service. There is a new wave of cyberpunk, uh, which is epitomized by Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, where he gives his own interpretation um, of the Gibsonian cyberspace and calls it the metaverse. Uh, all of that, um, I, I was getting into the workspace. And so I, I didn't like being an employee. Uh, I only was an employee for like six months or so uh, of, a, of a new media company, multimedia company. But then I founded, um, I soon after that uh, left and, and continued working for that company as a, as a self-employed person, but I founded my virtual reality company, eSpaces. Uh, actually, in 1991, I had already uh, started doing my first VR project. Uh, I don't have a slide of that, but it was called Cyber Term, short for Cyberspace Terminal. And it, I was doing the user interface design and, and some work on the 3D graphics engine for a company out of Adelaide in Australia. And the goal of the project was you've guessed it, the implementation in reality of the Gibsonian cyberspace and the Neil Stevensonian uh, metaverse. So one of the first projects of eSpaces was the uh, design together with uh, uh, another uh, friend of mine um, uh, of um, a virtual reality interface for uh, what what many people used before the World Wide Web, which was CompuServe. So, and that was called uh, VISIS, Visual uh, CIS Compu uh, CompuServe Interface uh, System. And I presented that as my, as the subject of my very first presentation at a VR conference in New York in 1993 or so. And then we're, we're moving further on this thread of the development of the metaverse and cyberspace. So in uh, 1998, I uh, got uh, commissioned to do a multi-user uh, world called Virtual Europe. I was paid to do that, or my company, and I were paid to do that by the European Commission. And in the top left corner, you can see in small the avatars of Tony Blair, who was then the prime minister of the United Kingdom, and Jacques Santerre, the then president of the European Commission. And so we had them walk through their avatars, walk through this uh, virtual ribbon uh, that we had set up to inaugurate the, uh, the virtual Europe. And that was done with uh, 17 different language interfaces. And you, you see the graphics are quite clunky. More uh, vir social virtual worlds that we did was also for children. So we created a very safe world for children that is completely fairy tale themed. Uh, and that was uh, uh, featured on the cover of one of the magazines of the SIGGRAPH uh, uh, conferences. And so they could go in there, multi user, and go on treasure hunts in this fairy tale wonderland. In 2000, we won, uh, won our first uh, award for, uh, in, the, in the field of virtual reality for the best virtual reality application at the VR World Conference in Barcelona for the Munich Airport Center that you see here. Again, multi-user using VRML, uh, the equivalent for 3D content of HTML uh, at the time. And it came complete with commercial applications like this Audi store and then the business center. Uh, a big seminal moment uh, for us, but also in the, uh, pour la petite histoire of the development of the metaverse and cyberspace was our launch in 2001 of iCity. And basically this was very similar to Second Life 
uh, but uh, focused on the Jewish diaspora. So it had a, an interface in Hebrew uh, and in English. And in, uh, it, had, it was a very a sprawling, uh, open-ended social virtual world where people could go and uh, set up, um, buy an apartment or rent an apart a house in the kibbutz or in old Yaffa or in a modern version uh, of Petah um, Tikva near Tel Aviv. And so you had dance nightclubs, all of the stuff that you may remember from Second Life. And you had shopping malls and you had an internal currency and, and all of that goodness. Okay, moving forward, in 2006, uh, unbeknownst to me at that time, uh, was published Lunar Explorer. And so this was a big first in the field of virtual reality for space buffs and for the space settlement movement, because the very first time uh, a, on your consumer PC, you could have fully immersive as well as uh, a flat screen access to virtual, uh, a, ver a complete version of the moon, uh, complete with uh, all of the landing sites of the uh, Apollo missions, the surveyor missions and the Luna missions. And so um, this is uh, Lunar Explorer being showed to, on the top left is Bert Rutan, uh, who you may uh, remember. And so we, again, look at the old clunky VR headset that was used for accessing uh, virtual moon. By the way, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Lunar Explorer. Okay, moving on. In uh, I, I had I was living in Tenerife by that time in 2001. Uh, a, um, a local um, a researcher in uh, astrophysicist founded together with um, with uh, Brian May of Queen the uh, Starmus event and. Uh, we attended, uh, I attended the event uh, because, I mean, it was local, but it was star studded with not only Brian May, who played, uh, you know, his Last Horizon song live uh, uh, one evening, and then there was Charlie Duke, uh, who, uh, and we all went uh, up on the Mount Teide for a observation of the stars using augmented reality on my tablet uh, at the time. And so um, that was kind of a point where I started going back uh, towards uh, my, my passion for space flight and looking to combine it with my other passion for virtual reality and augmented reality. In 2017, uh, the European Space Agency, together with Jeffrey Hoffman, uh, who by then was no longer an, a NASA astronaut, but Jeffrey did five uh, shuttle flights, was on five shuttle flights, including the ones that repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. And he did EVAs for repairing the Hubble Space Tel Telescope together with uh, Story Musgrave. So the European Space Agency, together with Hoffman and SOM, which is a world-renowned architecture firm uh, based in uh, New York, they built the following. They built a completely thoroughly engineered and architected design for a first village on the moon, and it's called Moon Village. Um, to make a long story short, I mean, this is a, an aerial view of a fully fledged um, moon village. And this shows uh, some uh, a side view, including the habitation module that I want to draw your uh, attention to. You see this tall one here? Well, uh, when um, the group who created the um, moon village was approached by the Venice Biennale, uh, to display a physical replica of the habitat, the four stories high habitat, um, they said yes. And so they are, um, um, and this was going to be shown physically in the Venice Biennale this year, earlier this year, but due to the pandemic, it was canceled. But we were approached uh, by uh, the group to 
produce the augmented reality views out of the view uh, out of the windows on the lower floor of this um, of this uh, physical replica. So the, the, the replica was real. This is an, uh, an artist rendering of one of the higher floors for habitation, and this is the lower floor. So in Venice, the, uh, at the Biennale, uh, people would be able to walk through the ground floor, the interior ground floor of the space habitat. And then when they would be looking out of those uh, long vertical windows, we would be e-spaces would be uh, showing the view of the rest of the village uh, animated with astronauts walking around with uh, swarms of robots doing uh, exploration and digging. And so that was uh, for us the first moment. Uh, we will, by the way, still uh, do this. Uh, the Venice Biennale has been moved to uh, next year. And so in May, I believe, uh, what we have um, prepared for this will go live in Venice. And uh, that really, for me personally, was the convergence, the merging of my, uh, my passion, sorry, for uh, space and space settlement uh, with virtual reality. But uh, it inspired me to go and see what else we could do for the new space industry. And we ended up, uh, we are in production on multiple projects now and in discussion with multiple uh, projects. Uh, and so for the new space industry, uh, we, um, we soon found out that there are numerous use cases for virtual reality and augmented reality and for cyberspace, for multi-user vir virtual worlds, beyond just the training of mission team members and, and astronaut EVA training. So the, the new space industry needs simulators for mission planning. Uh, they need digital twins to solve urgent issues uh, during a mission. Like for example, they wanted to have, they actually had kind of a physical uh, twin of the Apollo uh, service module for, during the problem solving of Apollo 13. And so, but now with VR, we would have uh, instead of physical simulators to go and check out solutions, we would we have fully realized uh, digital twins, including uh, simulation of physics. But also, uh, the space industry now needs live or wants live virtual reality tracking of mission progress. They want to do outreach, public relations, and public education via virtual reality. For example, SpaceX. Uh, just before the first uh, the demo flight uh, that took the Dragon uh, with the two astronauts uh, to the space station the first time, they offered on their website a small uh, simulator where in flat screen mode, but in virtual reality, you could try your hand at docking by hand uh, the Dragon capsule to the International Space uh, Station. And finally, or additionally, another use case is the colonization and the settling of space in virtual reality, using virtual reality as a dress rehearsal for going to space and settling space and starting the homesteading of space. And on that point comes the project that we are now in production in, and that is virtual moon. This really is the reincarnation of the project that I mentioned before, uh, because uh, Manuel Pimenta, the person who was uh, behind the Lunar Explorer project, uh, well, he and I, we found each other, and um, he has uh, rekindled uh, his project because some things were not achievable back then and now he wants to do it better and fully photorealistically with real-time ray tracing and all of that and so uh, and the the reincarnation of Lunar Explorer is called Virtual Moon and it will be a co-production between Virtual Moon LLC and uh, eSpaces we already have, and you may want to take note of this URL, we already have a, uh, a sneak preview that is working on um, the web uh, because we are using WebXR technology for this, which I can get to, uh, which I can 
go into greater detail about in the Q&A, if we have time for that. And so uh, moon.espaces.com, there we have the following. I um, will show you by means of this uh, pre-recorded video. One WebXR project that we are presently working on and that I have particular pride in presenting to you is the reincarnation of a project that was done in 2006, published in 2006 by a company called VirtuPlay, and it was called Lunar Explorer. At the time, it was a major achievement in virtual reality for the space industry because then, and until this day, it is the only published virtual reality simulation that features the entire moon. You can visit the entire moon uh, with Lunar Explorer. So what we are doing is we are now reincarnating all of the features of Lunar Explorer in WebXR and adding many, many more new features, such as multi-user access mode. So Virtual Moon is the name of the reincarnation of the project. And right now it is under construction. As you can see in the live demo on that screen, we have already recreated in WebXR, in VR, the South Pole of the Moon at a uh, URL uh, that you can access, which is moon.espaces.com. And the simulation allows you to navigate uh, freely using your cursor keys and your mouse or the WASD keys all over the South Pole of the Moon. Here at the bottom, you see that the, there is a slider. When you move that slider around, you change the location of the sun. So you have dynamic shadows that are being shown correctly moving over the elevation on the lunar surface. We also have buttons left and right, which enable you to navigate to other viewpoints on the above the lunar south pole and with several keys we can toggle some features in and out for example if we toggle on the l key we show labels appearing over all of the salient features of the lunar south pole if we toggle the i key we can see an overlay of the water ice deposits on the south pole of the moon. And this, of course, can be very helpful in mission planning for moon missions. Let's navigate to one particular feature on the south pole uh, called Mons Malapert or Malapert Mountain. This is, to my knowledge, either the tallest mountain on the moon or one of the tallest mountains on the moon. And it permanently has some part of it in sunshine. And the people who commissioned us with building virtual moon asked us to also build inside of the very top of Malapert Mountain, a city of several thousand occupants, which would be kind of an, a resort city on the moon. And we will be making a completely virtual digital twin of this city, complete in every engineering detail for air supply, for power generation, and all of that. When I mentioned earlier that virtual moon will also be multi-user, what I meant is that you will be able, once we are done, to go and virtually settle or homestead or have a stay inside of the virtual Malapert city and explore the moon in virtual reality. And this illustrates 
one of the ways that virtual reality can offer you the next best thing to be in there. The simulation will be fully photorealistic with ray tracing done probably for people who are on low powered hardware, the ray tracing and photorealistic high frame rate rendering will be done in the cloud and using a 5G or better connection, you will be able to enjoy highly photorealistic, high frame rate imagery in your virtual reality headset or on your device. So that is coming up and we are fully in production on the virtual moon as well as Malaport City, the virtual Malaport City. Again, Malaport City will be done in such detail that at some point we will be able to just print out the, the blueprints or the architectural engineering, the CAD models, so as to be able to create Malaport City on the actual moon. So in that way, the virtual Malaport City will be a kind of a training ground for the real Malaport City on the real moon. So uh, here is another view of an artist impression um, of astronauts at the top of Malapert Mountain and with, uh, with uh, work going on uh, below. This is another artist impression of the view, the picture window out of the main corridor of uh, um, what is now, by the way, uh, changed uh, to, uh, so Malapert City uh, will not be the name anymore. We will call it Selene after the Greek uh, goddess uh, for the moon. And so uh, the, the main corridor will be right through the top of uh, Mount Malapert. And uh, there will be a huge central aula where uh, in virtual reality, you know, we will uh, recreate this and there will be a conference center uh, you probably, it will be kind of a, a resort city, a virtual reality uh, resort city uh, for thousands of inhabitants uh, with concerts, with conferences, with exhibitions, with a VR space museum, with the ability to go and fly in the low gravity of uh, the moon uh, using just uh, flapping wings. And um, so, this project is very much in production now, and uh, we will be raising um, the uh, funds uh, or, or funds for the future phases of the project by means of uh, issuing a token. So our the previous speaker mentioned cryptocurrencies, etc. And um, the virtual moon will have the lunar as uh, L-U-N-A-R as its uh, in-world in currency. Uh, with which you will be able to pay the rent on your condo inside of Celine, etc. Now the project is going to be larger than just uh, the moon. Uh, we will uh, start with building the Earth Moon Sun system, uh, and we will then add, uh, for instance, a, um, a space colony uh, also for homesteading at the L5 point. Uh, I'm uh, working together with Keith Henson, uh, the founder or co-founder of the L5 Society, which that was later turned into the National Space Society in the United States. But uh, these are, by the way, not our own uh, art, uh, art renders, um, but by uh, Brian Versteich. Uh, and so, but we will be uh, having the Rossinanti design of uh, the L5 space colony in virtual reality and again intended for full homesteading. So very much in construction um, with our technology, uh, internal technology for multi-user WebXR, we are also uh, preparing the launch of uh, Metaspace. That will be our own multi-user meeting uh, technology and meeting solution for meeting in uh, virtual reality in flat screen mode on any device, uh, smartphone, uh, tablet, uh, laptop, or desktop PC, and immersively in uh, VR headsets and in AR headsets. So 
uh, a little uh, preview of um, Metaspace uh, that I will uh, narrate. So th this is a, um, remember the, the Celine City would have a big internal uh, um, uh, plaza. And so it would also have an observation tower, which would stick out of the top of uh, Mount Malapert. And this is a draft design for this, uh, for the observation deck on top of uh, Mount Malapert. And um, uh, we, we have our system uh, already has um, screen sharing such as the one that I'm using now, but then uh, not uh, via Zoom, but inside of our Metaspace system. We also have muting and, and other features. But with this technology, we are approaching another new business line, um, which is the event industry. And so we will provide to event organizers uh, everything that they need for doing their delocalized and completely coronavirus-free live events, completely in virtual reality. And we have uh, a TLD dedicated to that, which is uh, Viventer. So with that, we will be doing uh, expos and conferences in, in multi-user virtual reality with thousands, if need be, of uh, synchronous avatars using WebXR immersively or in flat screen mode to attend a conference from the comfort of their office or their home. Um, we can also do hybrid conferences, of course, which have some part physic in the physical world and the other part uh, in virtual reality. And circling back to how this uh, is relevant to this, the new space industry, well, we will be doing, uh, we will be offering venues for the new space industry for their conferences in uh, on the moon. And so there will be dedicated completely virtual reality multi-user uh, events and space uh, exhibits and, uh, and expos for the uh, the new space industry. Uh, we ourselves are planning to ha host one of these events ourselves. And so in 2021, we haven't decided on a date yet, we will launch the Lunar Space Expo, which will be a space uh, industry event focused on the, on the space industry, but um, inside of uh, virtual reality on the moon, probably on top of uh, Mount... Um, Mount Malapert. And so uh, these are some designs that we have for, for other industries such as the energy industry, but you get the point. Um, I would like to close on uh, this slide because it really epitomizes uh, the convergence of the space settlement movement with the the movement to colonize or to settle and homestead cyberspace. So cyberspace and the uh, colonization or the settlement, the, the space settlement movement have converged and are merging inside of projects like this one uh, with virtual moon, later uh, virtual Mars and the uh, Rossinante space colony at the fifth Lagrange point or the fourth at L4 or L5. With that, I thank you warmly for your attention and I hereby rest my case. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for many questions. Uh, actually, we have only time for one and, uh, and uh, I'll take this question. Well, I do like your project very, very much, and I look forward to walking in Celine and uh, you know visiting with my Oculus uh, Quest wrapped on all the beautiful things that you have done. And in fact, if you need anyone to test uh, the environment, by all means, count on me. But it's, at the same time, I'm afraid uh, that uh, I will feel very lonely um, in Celine because the same thing could happen that happened with Second Life, that, you know, we had a beautiful, cool technology because Second Life was very good technology 10 years ago. But uh, at some point, uh, everyone decided that it was too difficult or to, it takes too long to learn. Um, you know, Second Life went out. 
are things now with the next generation headsets and the new technologies reached a maturity in terms of user interface that uh, will uh, make people feel welcome immediately without having the impression that is something uh, too difficult for them to learn? Excellent question. Thank you for, for the question, Julio. So uh, our intention is to have a virtual moon and then virtual Mars, etc., be as uh, the next best thing to uh, being there, uh, which is, of course, the goal of uh, VR. So yes, uh, certainly in immersive mode, the user interface should feel very intuitive and natural. And uh, as you may recall, my formative years before getting into VR were in 2D user interface and user experience design. So I, I think I have a, a good shot at, at uh, making that interface extremely intuitive, natural feeling, etc., especially for the immersive mode. But remember that it will be accessible uh, in flat screen mode, such as Second Life was, as well as in immersive mode. And so for the flat screen mode, uh, we will create different user interfaces for different devices. So your user interface will be adapting to the device that you are using to access the virtual world. Uh, if you're accessing on a smartphone, you will have uh, touch uh, enabled. If you're accessing on a tablet, uh, same thing. But if you're accessing on a laptop it, uh, and desktop, it will be, you know, a kind of a, a PC a VR gaming experience, uh, but on a on a flat in flat screen mode. Uh, importantly, in order to make people feel extremely welcome and to uh, open the doors as wide as we can for uh, virtual moon and uh, and virtual soul, because ultimately we will want to do the asteroid belt as well and the entire solar system in virtual reality, photorealistic virtual via reality. So the basic version will be completely free, uh, but that will be single user so that uh, relatively poor students uh, uh, in the far province of India or sub-Saharan sub Africa, they can access it without any cost as well. Uh, the, you only will start paying if you want to use it in multi-user mode and then uh, have uh, expenses like uh, uh, user-generated content or user-generated uh, user-purchased plot of land on the moon or Mars where you can build your stuff like in Second Life. So it's all, so it will be the, the threshold. The, the goal is educational, really, and, and raising public awareness and inviting people to, to use this virtual reality as a training ground for uh, going to space for real later on. And so we think that the appeal will primarily be to people who are already in the space settlement movement. But with Elon Musk uh, being so in the public eye with uh, the Starship, and uh, which uh, did an interesting uh, training uh, flight, test flight yesterday. So with, with all this media attention on Mars and also the return to the moon, we think that the community, the, the hard kernel of the space settlement movement will grow enormously. And we hope and think, and we will do whatever we can to make virtual reality in the form of this virtual moon uh, space uh, settlement experience, um, we, we hope that we will be instrumental in expanding and um, uh, solidifying this uh, space, space bound and uh, space minded uh, movement of uh, regular people who, who want to go to space, who want to live in space and who want to already um, experience it before they can actually go there themselves, which might be, you know, still a few decades out for, for most of us. Thank you very much, Philippe. And uh, maybe just quickly answer the last question from Chaitania in the audience, who is not familiar with virtual reality, but would like to get into this uh, amazing field, she says. And she asks uh, how she should uh, proceed to get familiar with VR. What is your advice? 
my advice is to buy a Oculus Quest 2 virtual reality headset. It is the, the best virtual reality headset that you could ever in history buy for 299 US dollars. And it is uh, wireless, it has excellent uh, graphics. So it, it is just a, a milestone of a device. It is very easy to use. It has plenty of uh, free content and um, we will be offering access to Virtual Moon on the Quest 2 as one of the first uh, platforms to, to make it access, accessible immersively. So that is my advice. You will not regret buying a, uh, your first VR headset, just 299 US dollars, the Oculus Quest 2. Thank you very much, Philippe. And uh, now I'd like to ask uh, the next speaker to get ready. The next speaker is uh, Gabriel Rothblatt, who uh, is best known as uh, one of the first uh, transhumanist politicians who was a candidate for uh, US uh, Congress in 2014, I believe. He was not elected, maybe because he ran as a Democrat in a Republican county. We are all hoping that uh, one of these days he will announce that he wants to try again. Uh, anyway, uh, floor to you, Gabriel. There we go. <clears throat> all right. Um, am I able to present? Yes, you are. Oh, I can't see it. Do you see now? We see you well. But not my slides. No. Uh, if you want to show slides, uh, you should push share screen. And then uh, you have to choose uh, which window you want to share. Here we go. Uh, yes, well, thank you. Um, thanks for uh, organizing Julio and everyone for being here sharing uh, this bit of transcendence uh, with uh, uh, me and everyone else here. <clears throat> um, yes, so we had so many themes. It's been going on for, for so long now, not nearly as long as the uh, least experience with VR. Um, but we are at 15 um, colloquiums um, discussing the future of humanity um, and, and what we're becoming to be. And so the, the law of the cosmos, uh, which is the next level in the diaspora of uh, Excuse me, if I interrupt, Gabriel, uh, um, here, this here today. I cannot hear you very and, well because there is an um, ego. It uh, is a fitting topic. Um, I may... Excuse me, if I cannot hear you very well because there is an ego. Um, it mm. is Hold, let me help you. Thank you for... Uh, I think uh, maybe you should just wear a headphone. If it's an eco problem, just wear a headphone. This sound better. Can you hear me better than the headphone? Excellent.
Okay, and Julia, um, to check our time, um, is David Brin still following me? I'm uncertain if you can still hear me now. Yes, we can hear you well. We don't see you, but I think you have uh, switched off the webcam to save bandwidth, huh? which is good. So. Yes, and that should help the that should help the sound as well. Excellent. Okay, I will Great. continue. Okay, thanks. Excellent. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess a little bit about me, um, Gabriel uh, Rothblatt, uh, yes, uh, related to Martine Rothblatt, and uh, very much like um, Philippe's story, um, my interest in this subject um, came at a very young age and um, had much to do with my, uh, my upbringing and the influences that, uh, that my parents um, provided for me. Um, to be aware of these topics and, and to be interested and to follow them. Uh, for me, I have always, I think, gravitated towards a sociological perspective on, um, on the human condition and particularly how that will um, lead us to um, space habitation. I um, have a bachelor's in political science from the University of Vermont and I'm currently pursuing a master's in social innovation and sustainability from Goddard College. And it is uh, through that that I, I really got introduced to this uh, concept of decolonization and became fascinated at the parallels that it uh, has for um, space settlement. Um, There we go, advancing my slides here. Um, so I, I really am looking at what um, is the underlying conditions that create our society, our legal structure, and what we can learn about what that would um, mean for, for cosmos society, um, for those living in space, cyberspace, outer space. Um, based on what we know about ourselves as animals, based on what we know about our, ourselves as, uh, as the social creatures, and um, trying to get a sense of what um, lies ahead, um, in many ways looking at um, what has um, come from the past. So to, to begin, I, I want to start with, you know, what is decolonization? And to understand that, it takes, um, you know, an understanding of the history of imperialism and colonization um, throughout time. And so I've uh, included some, some basic definitions of, of imperialism. And um, it's, I don't think that there's, there are a few countries, uh, nations that you could say were never colonized by another nation, but I don't think that there is any place um, on earth that has not been touched by um, the problems of imperialism and the methods of imperialism, um, particularly colonization. Um, and, uh, and the, the, the tactics uh, there of colonization, um, things that we know of racism, um, of patriarchy, um, many of these things that um, perpetuate themselves as, uh, and, and the social inequalities um, that, that have arisen from them. Um, so I guess the, the word decolonization commonly used with an S instead of a Z, um, you know, came in uh, the, the early 20th century um, to start to describe countries um, of the um, of the countries that were um, seeking self autonomy. Um, now, this I, I really want to use lightly because 
the countries that decolonized in the um, S sense um, in the you know eight 19th, uh, hundreds, uh, you know eighteen hundreds nineteen hundreds. These um, I would loosely call decolonizations because they there was so much land, so much culture, so much power that still remained in the hands of the colonizing country, even though the the quote unquote reigns of power were passed to um, the settlers more so than the indigenous population. So I think that is a big difference between what. Um, you can say is decolonization with an S and then decolonization with a Z. Decolonization with a Z, um, meaning the, the actual repatriation of land, power, ways of being, um, knowing, doing, that still um, are illegal in many of these decolonized places um, that still have not repatriated uh, the indigenous population um, with, with their lands, their dignity. Um, so I, I really wanted to, to try to apply this concept of decolonization um, to the sociological problem of space settlement. And um, there, there was, you know, of course, a lot of interesting um, rabbit holes to go down. Um, and I think one that um, is is very important, um, and I want to to kind of have the theme running through this, is that decolonization is not a metaphor in, in, in that sense. So decolonization is not something that should um, be used to replace all of the other social problems that we experience and that other groups experience. Um, particularly, you know, for, for myself as, as an African American, um, you know, the issues of slavery um, are in some ways incommensurable with the issues of decolonization. Both of them are important social justice issues, but in order for slaves to receive justice um, from the colonial state, um, there are some issues that are problemsome for the issues of justice for First Nation or Indigenous peoples. Um, this is probably almost nowhere worse than it has been um, in, in, uh, for Native Americans. Um, but as I'll say, you know, people of all races, um, types, countries, nationalities have been touched um, by the problems of decolonization of colonization and even the 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 light form of decolonization um which you could say you know happens you know um in the united states um through through a revolution um still has not happened in any way in terms of reparations for slavery repatriation of indigenous lands um and and, and many other um structural problems um, that we have in, in society. Um, so let me continue. So if decolonization is literally unsettling, how can it be relevant to cosmists? Um, and that is, you know, a, you know, on its face of it, kind of, you know, if we want to settle space, how is unsettling going to help that problem? Um, and the reality is that actually colonization um, has been probably one of the largest obstacles to space settlement, even though it is in itself uh, to a degree an imperative, um, there is still so much planet to, to um, fight over um, that colonization, as it, I believe as Yelda said, um, in an imperial sense, will do nothing more than plant a flag on an object. Um, it has no vested interest in individuals, um, which is, I, I think, a, it reminds me another way of, of in, in the Elvis talk, her, her different, her perceived difference between San Francisco and Berlin as, as, as economic cultures. So, these, um, these two differences in, in, in approaches, um, I, I think the colonizer approach. Um, is much more likely to plant a flag and to leave it there as long as no one plants a bigger flag and to 
perpetuate um, not just in outer space, but in cyberspace, um, the uh, the problems of superior hierarchical um, structures in, in social environments. Um, and so whether we are talking about an indigenous alien race, we are talking about the captive mobile workers brought to some place to, um, you know, work the, the lands, or we are even talking about artificial or virtual um, intelligences. It is in the nature of imperial colonialism to subjugate. And that is a problem that Cosmos must confront and must confront on the front end if they are to have their own laws and not simply be projections of, of Terran imperialism. So I, at first, I, I, I want to say that I will be presenting um, means to um, see that the um, uh, that the repatriation of indigenous lands um, is something that comes out of this. But I also have to say um, that there is a level that we should accept space settlement as a colonizer moved to innocence, um, which is to say that all the settlers um, themselves, whether women, minorities, indigenous, um, are all victims of colonial imperialism. And we all have our own, um, you know, rights and justice that we are seeking. Um, we may never see a true repatriation of any indigenous lands farther than what we have seen. Um, and we can, um, although, you know, move forward as looking at space settlement as the, um, as the least harmful way to move forward without addressing the harms and um, wrongs of, of the past. Um, so as I move into looking quickly at, at some sociobiological background um, and then into some socioeconomic issues, um, you know, my, my, my premise is that decolonization is a precondition for Cosmos law, that until we deal with decolonization, um, you know, uh, on Earth, that we cannot attain to a state of of cosmos society and cosmos law. So, sociobiology is the scientific study of biology, especially ecological and evolutionary aspects of social behavior in the animals and humans. And it is these ecological and evolutionary aspects, particularly. Um, that uh, I, I focused on because for me, um, I do have a religious belief um, in the habitation, the migration of, of space. Um, I believe that it is likely written somewhere in the code of life um, to, to reach for space um, and that any form of life, whether it be avian, whether it be reptilian, whether it be, uh, you know, arbolian, what, what have you, that all forms of life are in essence um, images. They are archetypes of successful um, interplanetary species um, in earlier um, circles of our timeline. Um, so on the right hand here, you have what is called the social ecological model. Um, we all probably have seen it um, in, in many different forms. Um, and it is, yep, yep, thank you. Um, it is particularly um, useful for us here um, to reflect upon on two questions. You know, one is how the expression of our genes changes throughout new environments. Uh, and then two, how will the um, adaptation of technology um, allow us to, to assume some control and commands over, over this? So one thing that the socio-ecological model um, does not include, um, at least not directly, is um, ironically any mention of ecology. Um, so it doesn't really talk to how nature itself 
um, you know, informs the expression of our, of our genetic um, code, um, including behavior, um, which is, uh, you know, the, the foundation of what will then lead to um, the outer circle of the public policy, state, local laws and regulations, um, which is in essence what we're trying to get to, to discuss the law of the cosmos is how are all these um, s smaller circles, how do they feed into that larger circle, which um, is the, the fabric of uh, interplanetary law. So um, <clears throat> we have, you know, our, our, our individual and then our, our kind of our macro um, expression. Um, the, the expression of society as a whole versus the expression of, of ourselves, maybe onto genetic versus phylogenetic, um, you know, expression. So the socioeconomic paradigm, which is really what uh, I, I hope to, to, you know, present here, um, has five, you know, uh, areas that I think um, really are the, the pillars of the um, problem of decolonization that must be confronted before cosmic society can exist in and of itself. Um, and there are no particular order, um, actually, I just, uh, you know, of, of priority. Um, but uh, these are the, I think, the, the five um, overarching, you know, areas of concern that are rather universal. Um, in, in terms of uh, application. However, certainly some um, apply greater to some national cases um, than, than they do others. Um, first and foremost is the devastation of the natural environment. Um, colonization has, you know, it, it, by its nature, um, biological, ecological, or imperial, um, leads to homogeneity. Um, it threatens ecological biodiversity, Oh, in, in just about every sense of, of the term um, that, that you can use. Um, we have particularly seen this in the imperial sense um, through the development of a highly individualistic philosophy of possession, use, and ownership. Um, that means that if you're in possession of something, you can just completely um, destroy it um, and that was your right to do. Um, it removes the right of any other co-user, future user, or past user. Um, and that is, um, you know, has, has not been a sustainable um, concept. And we are, um, as, a, as a Terran society, not even yet a cosmic society, dealing with the realities um, that the devastation in the natural environment um, has, has had. So, through concepts uh, like Charles Eisenstein's um, sacred economics, um, the accounting for true cost of mining and fat and manufacturing um, makes the business case for case for space even better. You know, I am not someone who, who thinks that the business case for space is bad as it is now. I certainly have grave concerns um, and the devastation of the natural environment is one where the military industrial complex's role in the economics of space, um, you know, adds to the threat of, of you know, um, loss of the ecological biodiversity, um, even of the, you know, shared use of water and air. Um, but when we account for the true cost, and in this case, what we're really talking about is the cost of pollution. So currently right now, pollution is, is essentially not accounted for. That's why we are having conversations around carbon taxes and things like this, because the, you know, tens of thousands of years of maintenance of, of nuclear and coal ash waste um, is essentially just something we're passing on, assuming was going to go away or will be, you know, mitigated by future generations. And there's actually no assurance of that. Um, if we were to account for cleaning up 
of 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 of, of mines, strip mines, of of nuclear of decommissioning of nuclear power plants, it would be so cost prohibitive that we would actually be looking to space. The, that the economic argument for going to space becomes so much greater because we are accounting for the loss. Um, of the natural environment. We are counting for the ownership of future generations to, um, you know, to these, uh, um, um, you know, uh, man mining and manufacturing processes um, in particular. Um, and so, you know, I, I think the, 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 the realization here, and, and I think we're just starting to come to this because as, um, Eisenstein and, and, and many others have, you know, um, have described, um, we are coming up to a point where the, um, the bill is due, right? We are starting to pay those costs now. Um, and so when you look at removal of nuclear power plants, um, you know, the problems with Fukushima, um, the cost of these things are astronomical, um, pun intended. And so when we are looking for funding for things such as the space elevator versus rockets, um, which could possibly explode and send irradiated, um, you know, uh, waste uh, all over, you know, um, the planet, um, there, is, there is an increasing economic argument um, for space, space habitation, <laughs> space manufacturing, um, simply based on the devastation of, of the natural environment. Excuse me. And some of these things are going to loop into each other, so I'm going to keep on going. Um, but I believe that particularly here, um, this is important for cosmists themselves, because if cosmists do not take these positions in the foundations of their legal systems, then they um, are opening the door to allowing um, some of the demons of our archetypal nature to create themselves as the next frontier um, of, of, of imperialists. And so a cosmist society, in, in my opinion, um, must have these values um, at its core. So it is not dismantling living worlds um, as we are doing right now, which are themselves arguably conscious um, uh, living, living beings. Oops, wrong way. All right, so the next issue is the indentured servitude of women. Um, this is something that... Um, you could say began prior to imperialism um, and has some basis in our sociobiology due to the nature of our um, sexual um, beings uh, and our sexual reproduction. So the um, nature of, um, uh, while the uh, nature of, um, um, our, our dichotomy, um, it, you know, introduces conflict, the evolution um, <clears throat> of our biology has presented, you know, means to, to counterbalance that. Um, but where we are um, probably most at risk um, structurally is the lack of accounting of women's work in, in what was called the United Nations System of National Accounts, uh, which was a wartime tool, um, and how it is leading to the asocial reproduction um, of the what is called the nuclear family, which itself um, is a tool to further um, the ownership um, of a head of household, uh, which is typically the, the male. This social structure came about um, during colonialization and um, itself is completely unsustainable economically um, if you were to account for the work that women do as paid and particularly equally paid. Um, you know, many women are now able to work, but they still 
do not see, um, you know, uh, a, an accounting for the vast majority of, of what they're um, uh, expected to do. And so when we realize this um, section of our decolonialization, uh, um, we're looking at a, a, a very different, um, you know, social um, structuring at the base level. And that is something else that as Cosmos Society um, has been envisioned, um, we do see very different ideas of, of line and uh, marriages of, of kind of um, group uh, chosen type families um, versus uh, families which are, you know, just directly, um, you know, uh, patrilineal. Um, Excellent. And so then there are uh, the, the issue of reparations for slavery. Um, you know, decolonization does not absolve responsibility for reparations. Um, they are somewhat incommensurable. The U.S. government, for example, did promise 40 acres of, of Indian land as reparations for plantation slavery. Um, I would posit that, you know, not being able to give something that doesn't belong to you um, 40 acres and a mobile utility engine on a new world um, is, a, is, is a possible you know, alternative uh, to that. Um, space offers a resolution to the incommensurability of, of the captive versus native justice um, in colonial systems. Um, and the repatriation of indigenous lands. Um, first and foremost, I think this provides a very interesting impetus for mass migration of who would go, when, where, why, and how. Um, it also creates a new playing field in the international interplanetary exchanges um, when you aren't just playing with yourselves and, and your own colonies to make new rules. Um, the final area uh, is social security. Um, colonial accounting not only has um, made women invisible, but it has placed a greater value on the elderly than the young. And um, it's different from nation to nation, but social security, the care for the elder, um, is a rather universal problem that we are confronting in, in, in the modern world. Um, there, it is also interesting to note that the older you get, the less susceptible you are to radiation and the higher benefits you get from microgravity. Um, so I think that there is a great case here for Social Security um, to become a lottery for space habitation. Um, and the same numbers that we get are one identifiers um, and two um, kind of act like your uh, selective service uh, when the opportunity um, for your age, skill, or um, uh, displacement status uh, is called upon and prioritized for availability. I know we're a little bit over, um, so I'm going to yield um, the rest of the time uh, for uh, Mr. Bryn, and thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, perhaps, uh, we have uh, time for one question before giving the floor to the last speaker. Uh, I'm so deep uh, in uh, thinking about what Gabriel said that I don't have uh, a question at this moment. Does anyone have a question for Gabriel? Mm, doesn't seem to be the case. In which case... Uh, I, I, can, I can ask uh, a it, maybe Gabriel could comment on um, maritime law and seasteading, which I know he knows something about, um, but I feel like, you know, we're going to have to rely heavily on um, international law, maritime law, the law of the sea as we go into space. I, I just didn't know if he had anything to add on that. Yeah, that is a great question. And I think it is some of our best, um, you know, uh, grounds um, to, to look at for how we move forward uh, uh, here. Um, unfortunately, you know, maritime law um, does not offer a lot of great um, uh, uh, precedence 
um, for that. Uh, probably the best thing it does is for, um, you know, a conflict resolution on, on the high seas. Um, their, uh, you know, their, their system of resolving conflicts through a, a special court, um, you know, is, uh, it would be, I, I think that what, what we could learn most would probably be trying to, um, you know, mimic some of these arguments through the maritime um, court system. Um, there is a lot of uh, opportunity um, that we do to, to test these out with, with maritime law. Um, but however, unfortunately, I think uh, maritime law has offered itself to, um, you know, the colonial uh, powers more so than it has any, um, you know, answer for social justice. Um, uh, sadly, I think the, the, the probably the situation around cruise ships and the tens of thousands of people held captive um, because of their um, status as, you know, minor citizens and not imperial citizens um, demonstrates um, exactly the need to decolonize um, before we habitate. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, I'd like now to give the floor to the last speaker, who is uh, one of uh, my, and I'm sure one of yours, favorite science fiction writer. Over to you, David Brin. Uh, hello, Ken. Uh, first off, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'll hurry on ahead. A very interesting talk uh, by Gabriel, um, um, uh, reflecting um, the cultural value of a maturing civilization, which actually questions the um, behaviors of its um, revered ancestors and even its present day um, uh, leaders uh, and, and even its present day values. Um, the interesting thing is, of course, that that almost never happened throughout history. We're the first in all of history to systematically teach large fractions of its young people that their greatest civic duty is to uh, interrogate um, their own um, their own uh, tribal elders. Uh, and and I think that uh, this uh, Gabriel's talk really reflected that. Um, that uh, highly uh, that that value system, which is the only thing that can save us after six thousand years of of uh, brutal brutal patriarchies on all continents by all peoples, I am going to uh, do a share screen now. I'm hoping I'll do it correctly, and I have an awful lot to cover because I have a slideshow that was meant for that was modified, a slideshow that was meant for an hour. And I believe I just have half an hour, is that right? Hello? Uh, in theory, you have 20 minutes, but in practice, oh. you take, uh, in, uh, in practice, you take all the time you want and we oh. will be happy I'm to listen last, to you. I'm, I'm the last guy, okay, let's That's go. That's it. All right, <clears throat> so. All right, let's talk about co cosmic aspects of the near future. I'm, I'm hired uh, by all sorts of ranges of people from activist organizations to government agencies to talk about the future. So, uh, wow, it's here. Uh, okay, so why did I do this? Why did I change the date to 02020? Well, uh, I'll, I'll let you guess about that until the end. Okay, here's some of my credentials. Uh, I've been writing about the future for a very long time and The Postman was made into a movie. And uh, many of those books up along the top are being revised, given new introductions and being reissued uh, as we speak during across the next three months. So um, it's quite a time. Dol talking dolphins in space, how's that? Okay, we have many problems. We, um, although the, ra the ratio, the percentage of the, ch of the world's children who are starving and, and have no education available is the lowest it's ever been in the history of our species. And the ratio of those who come home to refrigerators and, and at least basic sanitation is the highest that it's ever been. The, re the remaining amounts is absolutely horrific and should tear at our conscience. And we are able to think two thoughts at the same time. We are able to recognize fantastic progress and recognize that we should absolutely feel uh, 
a gut-wrenching guilt over what progress um, has been neglected and, and how it could have been so much more. All right, I made this slide long before our current problems, but boy, do we have problems in regarding that's, that slide. And if wealth disparities continue on the path they're heading toward, um, we're, we're without the slightest doubt headed for revolution. Only the um, complaining people will have on their side all the folks who understand nano, bio, and nuclear. It's just stupid uh, not to uh, buy off this revolution with reform. And then there's how the universe could get at us. Now, I've, here's a slide that I've been giving a lot, different agencies, futurists, and all of that. And it's basically about how civilizations have failed in the past. And as Toynbee points out, and as more recently Jared Diamond pointed out, um, there were methods by which civilizations assured their own calamities in the past. And there are new ones. Um, along the left-hand side, you see natural calamities uh, that can strike, um, ecological suicide, which Gabriel spoke about uh, and is a major focus of Jared Diamond. And, and of course, my own novel, Earth, back in uh, 1990, um, and the works of Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, enemies in war. Uh, many, uh, many civilizations were brought down that way, and there are those who believe that we are currently under attack uh, by those who do not want uh, the kind of civilization that questions itself the way I, I described earlier. Um, societal meltdown, that one should irk and hurt because uh, we're experiencing it, and the feudal attractor state where most continents for most of the last 6,000 years um, brutal males uh, in, uh, imposed um, not just patriarchy, but a, a fierce class uh, protective system, and then being outcompeted by others. All of these are things that should cause us twinges right now, but on the right you have some that are being discussed by uh, groups in Oxford and Cambridge who came up with those books there about new ways that we might um, destroy ourselves or destroy our, uh, our hopes. And that may be classic ways that have are responsible for the Fermi paradox, why we don't see signs of aliens out there. I believe, for instance, the feudal attractor state is so powerful um, Darwinistically that that it may indeed have um, have its um, have its effects. Um, so there's the Anthropocene, which is ecological, deadly innovations, bio, nano, cyber, sci-fi, and the danger of renunciation, that there are forces in society that believe that the way that we can mitigate the problems of advancing into the future rapidly is by renouncing the future. And there are very strong forces on the right that are pushing for this, and there are forces on the left that also go for a romanticism that, um, that says that we must pull back. And then there's rigid over-dependence on fragile systems. If anybody's interested in that, they should write to me separately and I'll provide um, the breakdown of overly fragile systems that we have that I did for, um, for a recent publication. Now there are two concepts that are bookends to all of this. One is the singularity and that is that something may happen where we um, have a technological breakthrough that simply throws out all calculations. Say, for instance, all peoples around the world get access to um, either um, cyber enhancement of their um, brain capabilities, or perhaps something that's just coming up lately and came up in my novel Existence, and Temple Grandin uh, gave me a blurb for that, is the notion that average people may get access to savant capabilities, which would enable them to, in many ways, keep up with the machines and even exceed the machines. All of these are possibilities discussed in science fiction, but only a few of them are really um, starting to clarify before us. The other bookend is the concept I mentioned earlier, and that's the Fermi paradox, and that is, uh, are any of these things so common and so compulsory that they are ex help to explain why we don't see signs of predecessors across the cosmos? Not only um, 
these, these Brits uh, in Oxford and Cambridge uh, believe that um, it indicates that we have no chance, but I believe what it indicates is that we may be the ones who are called upon to go out into the galaxy and save others, because I think we can skirt past a lot of these things, but just barely because of some quirky traits that we have. All right, so in uh, my novel Existence, and um, uh, you can, uh, I'm sure that somebody in the organizer will share the, some links, I'll provide a link to the uh, three minute video trailer for Existence, best three minutes you'll have with your, with your clothes on. Um, and we're all cousins, that's the most important thing that we have to uh, recognize and uh, our, Great, great grandchildren will be of all races. And so it's simply stupid Darwinistically uh, not to include everybody. All right, so uh, yeah, these are images. Uh, now the, the dream, the dream of heading out there. Well, one of the things about colonization is there's nobody out there that we know of. So if we were to, um, uh, get access to space resources, which we'll talk about, then there's the possibility that nobody's being exploited. Now in the um, very popular and excellent TV series, The Expanse, they manufacture an underclass because that provides you with the, um, with drama. But the uh, situation in the, in, the, in the TV show Expanse is impossible because human females cannot spill into the world enough babies to overpopulate the riches that they are accumulating from those asteroidal resources. It's just not possible, physically possible for human women to, to create that many people um, to keep up with the rate at which wealth is being created in that universe. So um, being able to create wealth out there is one of the uh, top reasons that we could then be able to stop tearing into our mother planet and have more than enough to continue what we have been doing the last 70 years. And that is um, giving a lot more useful stuff to people, to people of all races. All right, now we've fallen into a zero sum fight over the immediate goal, the moon versus asteroids. So what are the comparisons? Let's, let's start with resources. Uh, we do know that the, the lunar poles have water. I am, an, I am an advisor with NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts program called NIAC. And we have given grants to um, groups that are trying to develop water from either asteroids or the lunar poles. And my, uh, my uh, thesis advisor at UCSD for my PhD uh, actually predicted water at the lunar poles. Um, and that's a great thing. But if we can get it from elsewhere, it's much better because A, it's, you wouldn't have to haul it out of a gravity well, but B, there may be just enough water on the moon for future lunar cities. And to talk about a colonization problem, if we use up what they would need to live before they even live, that's not a very good idea. Okay, so where are ores? I'm gonna take a, uh, you, I'm sure that these slides will be shared with you, but it's important to recognize that most of the metal in the earth sank into the earth's core before the earth moon was formed by a colliding Mars uh, sized planet. So starting metal poor from the earth's crust, the molten moon's remaining metals then sank into its own core. So the only metals at the surface are those bound into tight oxides, aluminum oxides, silicon oxides, titanium oxides, which are very hard to split and refine, uh, need prodigious energy. On Earth, elements got separated into ores by water processes that are absolutely missing on the moon. So there's some scattered meteoritic iron if you want to drag magnets and a little ice at the poles um, at pole sites that have zero sunlight, by the way. Helium-3 is an absolute myth. The sure, maybe in a hundred years, maybe, but there are no customers. There's nobody buying helium-3. And it's a, and all the space, all the lunar resources you hear about are in parts per billion. So many asteroids, on the other hand, come from either water-rich comets, so they're, al they're almost 50% water, or more, 
or else a shattered protoplanet, <coughs> which includes pure refined <coughs> metal from that planet's core. So there is, and, and what this slide, I don't have time to go into it, what it shows is that the lunar surface is not a way station to anywhere. Um, it is not energetically a way station. Time is another matter. <clears throat> the lunar surface is much more accessible by time. So it's a better way place for astronauts. But as far as energy is concerned, it's easier to get to the near Earth crossing asteroids. Um, OK, so let's compare it. Uh, the moon is much closer by time, two to five seconds for tele. Uh, operation, just days for human arrival, but each person day costs huge amounts of money. Asteroids, trip times, and zero G are problematic for humans, but fine for robots. So robotics is the, is the crucial tech. If we can develop robots that can um, melt or mine or refine asteroids, this is simply a no brainer. There is nothing on the moon that um, should is economically of interest. Um, I, I go through a bunch of other things like whether or not it's a good place for practicing landings, um, whether or not the dust on the moon is poisonous. Um, but as Andy Weir, the author of The Martian said when he wrote Artemis, his, his, moon, his moon colonization uh, novel, the only purpose of a lunar colony in the near term is tourism. So is there a sweet spot? Um, well, uh, the moon can be useful for testing our landing procedures for Mars. Uh, we should uh, experiment on robot returned asteroidal matter. Um, and, and we need to recognize that I am not saying that humans won't go back to the moon humans will go back to the moon. There's no reason for America or Japan or Europe to go to the moon. Um, there are wannabes who need their uh, validation, their Apollo validation. They desperately need it and they will go. There will be human footprints on the moon within the next 10 years easily. They will be Chinese, some Russians, uh, billionaires, Indians. Uh, all going to the lunar surface to say, today I am a man. They're going there for their bar moons buzz. And I think the ideal situation for uh, the United States would be to keep their hand in with robots on the moon and continue exploring robotically because after all, I could be wrong. They might find something, magnetic monolith, I don't know. Um, but also to sell hotel and landing services to the tourists. Um, also a lunar um, orbit um, uh, station would be useful as a garage for national security assets, uh, which would help keep the peace. So there's Andy Weir's, uh, the crux is the moon's principal attraction in the near future is tourism and symbolism, a national rite of passage that US achieved 50 years ago. Humanity is going back to the lunar surface for that reason. US can sell hotel lander services. I expect that um, Bezos, et cetera, will even if NASA doesn't, while monitoring what others find there. Meanwhile, Japan just returns asteroid samples. We have asteroid samples returning. These are things that only we can do. So why should we not do the things that only we can do instead of copying things that we did 50 years ago. That's my pitch. All right, now here's another aspect, and that is we need to keep our eyes open for interesting possibilities that I talk about in my novel Existence, uh, and that were talked about even earlier by others, and that is the notion of whether or not the Fermi paradox has another solution, and that is they're already here. And I portray this in existence and some of the best places to look for possible lurkers. These would be von Neumann's self-replicating probes that entered the solar system, perhaps even a million or two or 10 billion million years ago. 
Um, one possible place is we've been discovering co-orbitals. These are sort of semi-moons of, uh, of the Earth moon system that approach at various intervals, regular intervals, and then, then drift away again. It's the perfect place to <coughs> sample the Earth and take a look and see if anything's been going on there here of interest, and yet stay mostly out of reach. And there are some plans now to ping these co-orbitals and see if there's something there. Very interesting. Uh, and here's one, here's a couple of them. Uh, so we may, uh, and there's the shape of these weird orbits that they follow. And I talk about it in existence. And there's the, uh, oh yeah, there's the link for the, um, for that um, trailer for the book. Okay, so let's get back down to earth. Uh, in existence, there's a, there's a news reporter. Everybody in the year 2045 has got augmented reality. I had to explain augmented reality as recently as four or five years ago. Now, um, I don't have to explain what's going on in the inside of her shades, but those, um, those tendrils, those antennae, are the natural extensions that would let a short person be tall, look around, um, uh, see what's going on around them. Uh, they might detach and serve as, uh, as drones to see what's in that dark alley ahead. These are great, these might be the complete the notion that augmented reality would be the great equalizer. And I talk about this in my nonfiction book, The Transparent Society, as well as my novel Earth, and of course in existence. Now, uh, I'm going to dive into something that uh, I give in my other, some of my other presentations, but I'm going to get it very quickly here. <coughs> the, the web has, uh, has become uh, excruciatingly uh, harmful uh, as well as beneficial. This is not new. This has been going on every time we developed new methods to uh, create stores of knowledge outside our head. And the printing press enabled millions of people to have memories outside their heads, have knowledge outside their heads. And glass lenses became a necessity when people trying to read realized they had poor vision. And so that propelled telescopes and microscopes. And so what you have is the augmentation, the prosthetic augmentation of memory, vision, and perspective augmented our attention. And always when these revolutions come, um, pessimists say that human beings can't deal with this vast expansion of what they can know, see, and pay attention to. It's going to have to be gatekeepered by an elite. And the, uh, this has, it will lead to crises. And always optimists said, this is going to expand what it is to be human. Humans will know more. They'll gain more compassion for others not like them because they'll be able to read about the life experiences of others not like them. So always in each of these um, crises of increased memory, vision, and attention, there were always crises that were uh, triggered. The pessimists were always right in the short term. The printing press's principal output for its first 50 years were horrible tracts of hate that exacerbated Europe's religious wars. But eventually books did spread and people started the long process that Gabriel is an, is a, an illustration of, uh, of expanding the ability of people to conceive uh, that the others, or I have a book called Otherness, that otherness is a positive thing. And therefore, compassion for others is something that we should develop. Uh, I could go into this in more detail, but the main thing uh, is, oh, and, and the arrival of a, of, of a new form of communication, radios and loudspeakers amplified orators to godlike power in the 1930s and almost killed us all. But 1950s television actually was an exception. Its benefits outweighed its disadvantages tremendously. And Gandhi and Martin Luther King credited TV cameras with saving their lives. Okay, so we're right now we're heading into this era of the knowledge mesh. 
um, and supervision and super immersion. And if there was crisis that's resulted is a breakdown in coherence and confidence. And uh, we need to find solutions to this. And uh, I've been proposing some, others propose some. Uh, if what's going on in the United States of America right now is uh, enemies are using some of our own inventions and some of this expanded ability to know and to see and to pay attention and using it to undermine the very things that have made us strong. For example, the uh, character trait that Gabriel illustrated so beautifully uh, of um, societal self-criticism, which was almost completely absent in every culture um, of the past on every continent um, and is a source of fantastic strength and nobility for this uh, rising world uh, culture that uh, he and many others are trying to build. Um, that aspect of self-criticism is now being used against us uh, in ways that, that, um, that uh, are like a metastasized cells spreading um, disinformation and uh, mutual distrust. Uh, so it's a strength that is being warped by enemies against us. All right, so next in my talks, I talk about AI and human augmentation, tech addiction. I won't go into any of that. The, the increasing diversity of those we call human will spread beyond races and genders. It can include um, those animal species that we might, and I think we, we already have begun uplifting, as in my uplift novels. Uh, certainly robotics, certainly in the search for aliens, um, <clears throat> in the talents that we develop within our own um, minds and in uh, augmentation of our children, which for well or ill is going to happen. Uh, so we better start thinking about the pros and cons now. Uh, I have slides that talk about the various ways in which uh, human augmentation can take place. The number one is simply remedial interventions. Uh, it's been proved without a doubt that if you simply supply all children with nutrition, health, and education, the average IQ of their generation goes up 15 as much as 20 points. So if you want human augmentation, the number one thing you do is you take care of the remedial stuff and you'll get a lot more creative people and a lot more calm people. I was involved in the 1970s in the elimination of lead from gasoline. 20 years later, crime rates plummeted all across the United States. So we need to do more of that sort of thing. But there are other ways in which augmentation is going to proceed, such as games that teach. These are getting a boon in the um, remote learning. Um, and maybe one of the best things to come out of this uh, isolation um, pandemic. Pharmacological changes I've discussed, prosthetic, cyber neural links, biological computing, no time to get into any of these because we need to get back to space. And of course, as I said, robotics are going to be a huge, whether they're scary, sexy, depressing, um, or simply replace us, um, it's going to be a, a major part of our future. And the question is, will we meet others? Well, I think we will. I think it's going to be within the next five years, whether or not they are truly others or artificially generated ones that are meant to screw us up like these monoliths that, that, uh, that have been placed out there as art projects. What the monoliths <coughs> show is that there are guys out there who will do anything as soon as they can for the old reason that immature males have always done unwise things, and that is the magical incantation of justification, because we can. And there will be people who will um, spread mythologies, um, um, AI, automatic response systems. I portray this in existence. Um, whether they're true or not, most likely not, we will experience contact um, pretty soon. Okay, so the dream of space has not died. There's a material enough out there in the asteroids for 3,000 surface area Earths. 
if we go back to the dream of the 1980s of O'Neill colonies and things like that. And um, with every ethnicity being able to have its own uh, special place if it chooses to not mix so that you have thousands and thousands of diversity ex experiments um, increasing our diversity and our cultural breadth. Um, but in order to do that, we have to push ahead, not renounce. So all of which prompts the question, um, you know, are we actually simplistically moving in a direction? Now that's called teleology and it's highly suspect. But nevertheless, if it enables us to do what Gabriel was talking about, and that is at long last question the uh, rapacious empires that almost all of our civilizations partook in, um, and to question them and to question um, all of the assumptions that led to a failures of otherness um, and find our mistakes. And if we can get past the latest crises of, um, of communication uh, so that we get back to negotiation instead of uh, demonizing each other, then there's a real chance that we can move ahead. Um, and we have to remember that um, what we are seeing around us, uh, even in America, this highly advanced civilization is uh, appeals to uh, either pasts that were real or pasts that were fictitious. And this is a scene from that uh, trailer for existence in which, you know, there's the, the calls to reject forward progress are things that we are going to see more and more appealing to people's uh, particular symbolic paths to um, tr uh, trying to achieve the same thing, a renunciation. Uh, I want to do a little plug here for a little project I've been engaged in, and that's called TASAT. It's uh, a, an attempt to create a online discussion and database so that anytime there is a crisis in the future, anybody who's trying to deal with a crisis can come and query, uh, has, it, has there ever been any science fiction about this sort of thing? Let's say mole people come out of the ground. <coughs> or triffid plants start walking around trying to talk to us, TASAT would be able to instantly say, um, there have been science fiction stories that worked out scenarios about this. So um, it's TASAT, T-A-S-A-T dot U-C-S-D dot E-D-U. And we're still in early days and we need help um, either financial or volunteer uh, programming to help um, bring this to fruition. And who knows, there may come a, a day <coughs> when a particular scenario happens and a particular science fiction story from the 1950s saves us all. Hey, it could happen. Um, okay, so do we have a chance? Well, uh, those guys in Oxford and Cambridge don't think so. They think that list from my first uh, early slide um, is too daunting and it helps explain why no one is out there and we won't be out there either. On the other hand, I have reason to believe that we are special, that we're unusual. The fact that we can do experiments that divert from the classic patriarchal feudalism uh, motif that dominated almost every uh, agricultural society all over the world, we can because the experiments have been pulled. Periclean Athens, Da Vinci's Florence. Um, uh, there were two um, experiments in India, ancient India and um, Amsterdam and our 240 year experiment in reciprocal accountability and flattened power systems. Um, that may be rare and if it is, um, and especially the possibility that we might be able to voluntarily switch from male-dominated uh, uh, societies, which are understandable during periods of great fear, which almost all of our ancestors lived in, 
um, to a far more relaxed and reasonable uh, female-centered uh, system of governance, uh, led by Jacinda Ardern, I hope, uh, if I could press a button. Um, <clears throat> not through calamity, not through anger, but through the simple recognition that when our fear levels go down, we are able to reduce the testosterone levels and, and move over to a system that is based more upon mediation and negotiation. Um, then, then, then perhaps in that case, the galaxy may actually get somebody traveling through it who would find the others and help to rescue them. What a possible way to regain some optimism here at the end of this ghastly year. So our years speak to us. 2020 was harsh. I am old enough to tell you that any of you snowflakes who feel ruined and wrecked by 2020 would not have lasted two weeks in 1968. 1968 was worse in almost every conceivable way and two, any two weeks would have killed you. But that's an old fart talking about how our bad years were much better in our day. The point is 1968 ended with something spectacularly wonderful. Like Pandora's box, we had opened and it seemed like we'd spilled every horrible thing into the world. And the nation was about to fall apart, but the very last news item, you look up what the very last news item was in 1968. And it was a symbolic diadem of hope at the bottom of Pandora's box, the very last news item of 1968. And maybe we'll have that excuse for hope this year. In any event, 2021 might be an improvement. Gosh, we're hoping so. It certainly looks like it might be. But even better, add a zero in front. This is, this is an innovation of the Long Now Foundation and I think we should all spread it. If you add a zero in front of your date, you are making a gestural statement of confidence in our descendants that we'll have any, that, we'll, that, 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 that we will give them something that they can stand on and keep adding years for at least another, what is it, 9,000 years? So in any event, and with that, I will open things up for questions if we aren't um, desperate to move along. I'm sorry I went so rapidly through some of these points and uh, I'm, I'm sure that um, some of them will be uh, available for, <coughs> for um, links. Is anybody still there? Yes, we have. Thank you very much, David. And uh, I definitely look forward to putting a zero in front of this year and uh, the next one. I uh, see that a uh, lot may you, of may you personally May you personally add zeros in front of your years for the next 80 years. Thank you so much. May you too. I see that a lot of people in the chat are uh, saying that you gave a great talk. Uh, uh questions like how can we make peace with forces far superior to us lovercraftian gods and this comes from a person who is looking forward to buy your book existence and uh, may i recommend also all other books by david they are great huh? uh, lori lori says uh okay just uh Wishing that 2021 will be better than 2020. I think we all wish that. Okay, who has uh, a question for David? Um, happy to talk about any of that stuff. Um, I think that it's important that we be able to, while we are criticizing our own culture, to be able to recognize that the encouragement we've received from Hollywood to criticize our own culture is embedded in almost all the Hollywood films and much of the music and, and most of the novels that we've read. We were brought up with this meme. It's being used against us now. 
but it is a fundamental strength. And uh, I think that it's important that we recognize and acknowledge that to some degree now and then. Uh, did, did that give someone time to, um, to uh, I'm looking at the chat, any other questions? Uh, no, how I think that make, I... How can we make peace with forces far superior to ourselves? Lovecraftian gods? Uh, well, I am not actually a science fiction author, or uh, I am a front for several aliens and AIs who write novels and sell them through me. Um, I will tell them, shut the hell up. <sighs> they think I'm joking, okay? They talk to me through these fillings. That's why they're really desperately afraid. That's why I get the longevity treatments because most of the young people don't have the fillings that enable them to talk to me, but they used to use pain. Stop that. They think I'm joking. <sighs> Idiots. Just because they have IQs of 9,000. Uh, I'm, I I'm very interested in your point that uh, you know it makes more sense for the United States to do things like mining the asteroids rather than going back to the moon. Uh, I kind of disagree. I'd like to see people go back to the moon, but I can understand your arguments, and I'm uh, not from the US anyway. So I consider myself as uh, part of that rest of the world that will uh, eventually, finally, perhaps soon, go back to the moon. But I'm just wondering whether you have read the, the science fiction book, uh, uh, Red Moon, I believe by King Stanley Robinson, and how likely you think uh, the scenario of a Chinese dominated moon would be? And uh, if so, uh, whether it's a scenario that the United States should be willing to live with. Well, I think that, um, uh, you know, Stan Robinson is a magnificent guy. He's my bro and he's one of the greatest of the greats. Um, he has become rather gloomy, but I think he points to good things. Uh, I think it's terribly important that um, China not be allowed to dominate this century. Um, but I don't think that an American presence on the moon uh, is, is vital to that. I think American um, domination with partners, um, I think domination is the worst, is a bad word. Uh, how about colonialization, oops, um, of asteroids, I think is terribly important. Look, we're going, we, humanity, we are going back to the moon. There's no question of that. It's going to happen. Um, the Chinese are going to go to the moon. The Russians will certainly try to set something up so that we give them all the technology to go to the moon um, because they can't do it themselves. Um, it, the Indians will want to go back to the go to the moon. Everybody wants their bar moonsmas. And I'm not talking about robotics, by the way. We should continue to send robots to the moon. I think we should continue to send orbitals to the moon. And I think that it would be a great thing if we um, sold landers or rented landers. Uh, when we get the lunar gateway orbiter above the moon, we should have, have hotel spaces, make money off it and say, welcome to our moon. But there is nothing to be gained from American footprints on that dusty poison plane in the foreseeable future. And it's going to be extremely costly. And what would happen is because of the cost, we would suddenly announce, oh boy, it's an international expedition and, and, and we're all gonna share technology, which means all of our technology will go to the Chinese for their landing. This is a lose, lose, lose proposition. The United States and China, uh, sorry, the United States and Japan have already hinted at what, what would be the best thing to do. And that is go to where the riches are. Humanity is going to go to the moon. Fine. 
I don't think that it, it, it puts China, even if China took over the whole moon, I don't think it would put them in any position to dominate the next century if we were doing the other thing. It's whether or not we're vigorous. It's whether or not we're doing, doing things that no one else can do in partnership with the Japanese and Europeans. Sure. Has There's anyone nothing else there. Uh, questions for David? Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Gavin. Um, what do you think we should do with Space Force? Can you read me? Yeah, yeah, Space Force, Space Morsh. Uh, <coughs> it's a done deal, it's done. It's done, I think that it should be used in negotiation to let, let Republicans have their symbolism. They're symbolism obsessed. Look at how they, how they required specifically patterns of navy, naming naval ships in such a way that no Democrat would ever again get an aircraft carrier. <laughs> it, it's absolutely amazing. Look, at, look up David Brin aircraft carriers and, and see how, how incredibly symbol obsessed Republicans are. And as far as I'm concerned, let them have their mm -hmm. space force. What I am angry about is the diversion of skilled professional officers from useful endeavors to designing spandex uniforms. And then, and then uh, you know, getting liposuction in order to fit them. Um, I think that if, we, if it can be done graciously and slowly um, and, and, and fob off the most useless officers into uh, designing uniforms, then okay, I, I don't care. Uh, but I, the, the whole notion of whether or not it becomes at some point strategically beneficial to some hostile power to let out EMPs and destroy our space advantages. This is something that I think is terribly, terribly worrisome. And that's one of the reasons I think we should build the Lunar Gateway Station because strategic assets can be garaged there safe from, um, safe from harm. Um, but that's a, you see, I, I'm not opposed to strategic thinking. I'm not, I think that the, it's terribly important that the United States of America be able to maintain the best time that humanity's ever had, which is the American Pax of the last 80 years. And I think I just made Gabriel's head, just, I just think I just made Gabriel's head explode. But there is simply statistically speaking, absolutely no uh, answer to the fundamental fact that the American Pax for the last 80 years has been the best time for humanity, including morale, morally um, in the uh, development of systems that Gabriel represents for self-criticism. Um, anybody else? Because I can expand on that. The fact is that, that, uh, that it's very hard under standard left-right or standard political dogmas to classify the statements that I've just made. You can see where they don't fit because I approve of the general trend, moral trend of the left, and I disapprove of the tendency of it to be sanctimoniously blind to how much progress we make. Um, so uh, I was... Uh, David said he would tell us at the end. Oh, yeah. Well, I did. Yeah. All right. Um, so any other questions? I have a new beehive I have to inspect. I just installed it last night. So if any of you come to visit, first off is keep your, keep your darn distance, but I'll provide you with some honey. I definitely look forward to come and taste your honey. All right. Um, well, um, I think. Will you, uh, will you be? Um, will you be letting people have? Um, you know what? I'll I'll insert into the chat uh, a few uh, links that people can find. Here is the trailer for existence. Whoops! It's going to. I gave that link already in the chat. You did already. All right. Yeah. So. All right. So. Um, in any event. I wish you all much success, and here's to um, uh, here's to a civilization that is finally worthy of that word. Um, 
Thank you very much, David. As usual, this was a great talk and a lot of food for thought. I would also like to thank everyone for attending uh, this event and also to invite you at uh, the next TerraSEM event, which as uh, usual should take place on July 2021, on uh, July 20, the anniversary of uh, Apollo 11 landing on the moon. Again, thank you very much for joining us and uh, see you next time.